Hello everyone and welcome to the Will I podcast. I'm your host, Will I, and this is the first podcast of the series. I would like to get things started off properly by introducing the podcast to you. Essentially, this is a variety podcast in the style of Joe Rogan, where I receive a variety of guests from all different backgrounds and walks of life. Each episode will feature reoccurring and new guests will join me in depth conversations about many subject topics, especially in the areas of their expertise. The podcast is family friendly, so it's clean and content is kept to a PG-13 level to a certain extent. All imaginable topics are covered, so there will be certainly a podcast episode suitable for you. Before we start things off, I'll introduce myself to you a little bit. At the time of this recording, in the beginning of March 2020, I'm 26 years old, I'm an automotive materials engineer by trade, I'm foremost English from the Midlands with European heritage. I have lived a fair bit of my life in Paris, France, and consider myself a polyglot, speaking fluently French, Italian, Spanish, and of course English. I have extended knowledge of the world politics, automotive industry, tech, travel, and world culture. No topic is foreign to me, and I approach conversations with my guests with an open and inquisitive mind. I believe multiculturalism and the acceptance of different views enriches us and makes us better human beings. So that's it for the introduction of the podcast. For the very first episode of the very first series of the Will Air podcast, I'm recording at Loughborough University campus in the materials department. My guests are Vian Patel, an automotive materials engineer finalist student, a dear friend and colleague of mine of whom I work closely with. We both share the same work etiquette and let the quality of his work speak for him. He's a very interesting and inspiring person. Vian deserves a podcast episode of his own. I will have him in the second episode to talk about his life experience and reflect upon the last five years at this university. He has a very interesting story, an elite socialite of the luxury nightlife, has turned his life full 180 to become an inspiring, work-driven individual. His stories and advices have definitely helped me become a better human being and inspired me and surely will inspire you too. Joining Vian as my second guest is another good friend of mine, Shubariam. So Shub is an interesting character. The saying goes, jack of all trades, master of none. Well, Shub is definitely a master of many trades. I find it difficult to stump Shub. Talk cooking, he'll prepare you a Michelin-style level three-course meal. Talk filmmaking, he'll put many star YouTubers to shame. Listen to him talk about cars, you'll think he's an automotive journalist. Show him your watch, he'll give you advice that piles up to the best London jewellers. You're probably picturing an old man with grey hair, plenty of knowledge and experience in his mind. You have the grey hair part, right, but he's actually a university student in his mid-twenties. So, the main podcast is cars and watches. These go together like bread and butter or hamburgers and fries. Watches are the gentleman's jewellery and the cars are the reflection of their persona. We will start off talking about independent watch brands and how they're shaking up the industry. We will then move on to Rolex, Cartier and the other major watch companies that are dominating the market. How the Apple Watch is affecting the whole Swiss watch industry. And finally, with the resale of watches and investments. To top it all off, we'll talk about cars that young aspiring graduates starting off their career aspire to buy and how the trend has changed in the last few years. Let's hit it. And I'm joined with my guest, Vian Patel. Hello, Vian. Hi there, Will. And uh, my other guest, the legendary Shub. Hi, Shub. Hi, Will. All right, let's get started to things. So I've got my guests here today, uh, which are experts in watches. This is, um, let's say, the Gentleman's Club. Uh, we talk about what is only acceptable as jewellery for men, which yep. is watches indeed. Uh, so firstly, let's get to a round of introduction for these people. Let's start with Vian. So how did you get introduced to watches? How did you become uh, interested, passionate about that area? I think for me, um, I got into watches because it just became a way of life. It's something that I wear on my wrist every day. Mm. Um, if I leave the house without a watch, my wrist feels really weird. Wow. Um, university days went through. Um, every day where I'd wear a watch, I'd use it in labs. You know, I use it to time myself between the house and lectures. Um, and I think my love for watches evolved when I met my uh, friend who is to the right of me here, uh, Shabaria, who follows the uh, same sort of passion for watches um, as I do. And he knows a lot more. I just oh, want wow. to put that out there. He knows uh, okay. a lot more than I do. So we'll, we'll call Shub the expert in the panel today. Yeah. <laughs> so this is how you got introduced to watches and this is how you grew an appreciation for them. Um, I merely have a knowledge about watches because I'm some just genuine bloke who wears an Apple watch on a day-to-day -day basis, but I can appreciate some quality stuff. 
Um, and then, sure, well, tell us, how uh, did you get into the watch industry? For me, it was, like, really similar to Vion. It's just, like, I feel like a watch is more than time. Mm. Like, a watch tells a story. Like, no matter, even if it's a Casio, it'll tell your personality. Yeah. Like, it reflects who you are more than anything. And it doesn't have to always be about cost. It's, like, sentiment as well. Oh, yes. And, like, what made watches interesting for me was, like, the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like, how you can put, like, a little movement can be so powerful. Can be pa it can power itself for, like, 60, 70, 80 70, hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, like, years if you keep wearing it all the time. Yeah. And, like, automatic movements, even quartz movements. But what's, like, really interesting me... In, uh, what's really interesting for me is like Swiss watches yeah. like especially like how these complicated mechanical movements can do so much like perpetual calendars like how they can keep going for like leap years and it can calculate that time oh 100% and this is something so you said that uh, complicated and this is a definition I'll probably uh people that know watches but are not very knowledgeable about what is a complication on a watch um, a complication in a watch is the movement itself. So you have mechanical watches that are like self-wound or automatic, or you have quartz movements. Yeah. Quartz movements use like a quartz circuit to, and it ticks. Whereas a mechanical watch, uh, it's more of a sweep. So you have six, eight, and even ten on like watches like a Grand Seiko. Ooh. And a ten per second is really hard to achieve. And I, I feel like the sweep, like the sweeping second hand, like it's just so satisfying to look it at. It is very Like satisfying. I'll show you my um, System 51 and just look at the second hand. Yes. It doesn't so, tick. To paint a picture to the listeners, the, it doesn't tick. It has a fluid movement. And that's very satisfying to watch on a watch. Pun intended. <laughs> That's very nice. It almost looks like it's on rails. It's on rails. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's really finely tuned. Which brings me on to getting uh, to know you guys a little bit better. What is for you your ultimate watch? The only watch, either sentimental or hashtag goals. Yeah. One watch. Two watches. Or ten watches. One. 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 One watch. <laughs> So this is this is a hard one. Um, I'm not going to tell you my previous choices because I'm only allowed to say one watch. But I think for me, if I had the choice to buy one watch, use it day in day out, use it at the beach, use it in the pool, yeah, a daily driver, have it in me, have it with me in the shower, that would be the Patek Philippe Aquanaut. Five one six seven. Okay, so for people who aren't knowledgeable about this, like, gives us a brief description of that watch. What's the prices? What materials did they use? Right. Okay. So, uh, Patek Philippe, um, very very premium brand. It's probably one of the oldest brands. Um, the watch uh, itself is a uh, it's a gold case. I believe it's a white gold case. Uh, the the strap is not your typical metal bracelet or leather strap, it is in fact a rubber strap, a silicon rubber strap. Mm. Um, at first glance, you might think the watch is from Argos. Oh, wow. Uh, because it hasn't got a conventional luxury looking strap, but this watch is very, very versatile. <laughs> it carries the Patek Philippe brand. Uh, the automatic movement is uh, second to none. Wow. Uh, the fact that you have a rubber bracelet allows you to wear that watch day in, day out. For example, when you're wearing a nice watch that has a metal bracelet, if, for example, you put your hand down on the table, you'll hear a clunk. Yeah. Whereas with this watch, because it has a rubber strap, number one, you won't hear the clunk, mm -hmm. and number two, you don't have to worry about scratching the bracelet, for example. Um, now, onto the cost. So a typical Patek Philippe Aquanaut will start at around 35000 Pounds. Wow. £35,000. Big numbers, right? That is the price of, say, a new BMW, for example. Yeah. Now, I'm not stopping there because the one that I want is the 5167R 001 reference. Oh, what does that mean? And this watch is rose gold with a brown <gasps> strap. Mm. 
and we're talking forty-four thousand pounds. Oh, God, That's that is huge. one watch. That is one watch that I'd slap forty-four thousand pounds down for, and I'd wear that watch day in, day out. And that's your ultimate. Yeah. That's that's a very compelling story, and it's a very compelling argument for a very expensive watch. The Shub, same question to you. For me? One watch. <laughs> what will it do? This is kind of funny, because my one's are Aquanaut 2. Really? But my one's a bit different. Okay, how's yours different? It's so, crazy how you guys got like a, a similar... You've, you've gone to the Patek Philippe, firstly. Yeah. And Aquanaut as well. So how is yours dif- different to... Be so my one is called... Um, Patek Philippe Aquanaut 5650G. Okay. Advanced research. So this is the first ever watch that Patek Philippe made with an open movement in the front face. So what's an open movement? So you can actually see the movement on the face of the watch. You can see the cogs moving. Because like being Patek, it's really prestige. And they don't they normally have classic move like faces and yeah. they're playing. And this is the first time that them going out of the box and making something like funky. And it's pretty cool. Like it's got an insane movement, and it's really rare. Ooh. We're so talking about five hundred in the whole world. Five hundred. And a retail price of fifty-eight thousand dollars. Fifty-eight. Fifty-eight. So how would you get one? It would only be by auction, I suppose. No. Um. You have to be a previous. Um. You have to have a lot of pieces. Wow. To actually get a. So you need to be eligible to buy one. Yes, you need to be invited to buy one. It's a bit that, like that's, Ferrari. That's that's, uh, exactly. that's a different story. <laughs> that's a controversial topic. It is a controversial story, and uh, Ferrari is unfortunately not the uh, last ones to be doing this and be on that trend. So that's cool. So fantastic. We now know you a little bit more better in the uh, watch terms. So let's get straight to it. Um, independent watch brands. So how are they shaking up the industry? What's what's the deal about independent watch brands? Firstly, what does that mean when they're independent? Independent is so they don't have like a partner. So they're just a small company started on by themselves and they just believe in their watches. So similar to like Pagani, or okay. Koenigsegg of the car world. Okay. So we have companies like FP Jean, MBNF, uh Recents, Moser. Uh, we have uh, Recents as well. Uh, we have uh, a brand that is a personal favourite of mine called Jacques Draw. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I think independent brands are coming up. Uh, my rain, my main reason why uh, this is this is true is because the resale market for premium watches is ridiculous. Um, if you think about it, you could get a, a standard Rolex for, I'd say maybe, uh, well. Let's be exact here. So a Rolex Submariner, maybe something, you know, sort of, I'm going to say for argument's sake, to cover the ranges, uh, £10,000. Okay. However, if you've got a green face, a Hulk Rolex, for example, you're now looking at just over 20000 You know, you've got a £10,000 difference. Uh, and unfortunately, the way it is, these watches are very hard to come by and very hard to acquire. Um, so unfortunately you will have to pay the £10,000 premium now this is where independent watch companies come in they are a lot cheaper they don't have invite only lists Um, you know a lot of them will appreciate the fact that you can come into their factories and look at the technology and the way that they handcraft watches together yeah yeah. Um, it's the whole interaction when you buy a Rolex watch the only thing that you're getting is the Rolex. You have to wait a whole year just to get your papers because they don't want you to resell them. Mm. Whereas if you have an independent uh, watchmaker, for example, you know, you've got uh, Jacques Draw, you can go to the factory and you can look at the way that the uh, the factory workers uh, paint yeah. almost onto the dial. Mm. That's the experience that you have. Um, and again, the thing that I keep saying is it's it's the cost, you know. You yes. can have the same technology for less money. So that brings me to a question is, all this is true, however there's a difference between independent watch brands and the big names, is that name recognition, right? Uh, I will use an analogy, bringing it back to cars again, because that's my area of expertise, is for the same quality, the same build, the same equipment, um, you can get yourself 
a BMW, let's say a 7 Series, an S Class, uh, an A8. However, for a third of a third, half the price, you can get a Genesis in the United States, which is way cheaper, a G90. But you, do you want to be driving around in a Hyundai or a Genesis? Would you prefer having that three pointed, that three star pointed badge? So what do you have to say for people say, I want that, that brand, I want that logo? How can you convert them from these staple names to independent watch companies? Um, I feel like these independent watch brands have more to prove. Okay. But they have a good customer base. Like right. people who love, like for example, I'll go with MBNF, Max, the owner. Mm-hmm. Like he has a passion for cars and spaceships and flying objects like planes. Yes. And that's what he, um, like when he designs watches, that's what he goes in for. Like he loves Canon watches or spaceships. So the MBNF HM6 was literally looks like a spaceship. Oof. Um, like um, starfish, no, um, jellyfish. Yeah. Like um, the HM8 um, MBNF looks like a jellyfish. Mm. Uh, it's just really cool how he thinks. So whatever he gets inspired by, he will make a watch about it. That's cool. And like, um, if you know of a term called tourbillon. Yes. So a tourbillon is a three-axis movement that spins around, and it's really. Um, Satisfying to watch. It is. It is very satisfying. Um, and they just came up with a new watch called the Thunder Dome. Okay. And it's basically domed, and you have a really complicated turbo in the middle. Wow. And it's just a tiny watch face on the side, and it's a dome. And I, I don't think other companies, for the price, it's really expensive. It's around 280,000 euros. Okay, so this is big money. This is, this is big money, but... Like, these big watchmakers, if they made it, they would charge, like, a million for it. <laughs> yeah. Like, Richard Mill, if they made something like that, they would charge a million for it. Wow. That, that's very special, because you can get something that's a tremendous quality of work for a fraction of the price. Yes. So, it's all about getting these people towards these independent... Um, well, it's, I think it could be for more this subtle gentleman who's trying to subtly flex in some way because you're not seeing that, that brand on your wrist. You're seeing something and people are inquisitive, people don't know what you have. Only experts know. Yes. So you're yeah. trying to impress the people that are into this field. So that is great timing because we can move on to our next one, which is the um, Rolex, Cartier, the major watch companies and their domination on the market. So we're just leaving from uh, these independents and their potential of what they can offer compared to the big brands. So talking about the big brands, uh, Shub, what can you tell us about um, this domination on this market? I feel like social media has increased the watch market crazy. Like everyone wants the AP now because of social media. Everyone wants a Pepsi because of social media. Richard Mill, the amount of business they're doing is because of social media. You see celebrities wearing Richard Mills, like RM35s, um, RM11s, because it's just like social media, because people see, like, watches, like, not all watches are flashy, mm-hmm. but it's just like, like, especially like Richard Mill, their shape is iconic. Uh, like AP, their shape is iconic, the bracelet. People see it on Instagram, and they, they want it. Uh, I will admit, I see some watches on uh, Instagram and I, I add them to my bucket list because it's just the way it is, really. Um, it's, Instagram allows people to explore watches uh, through a few swipes. You'll click on one photo, um, you'll back out of it, you can go on the suggested page on Instagram and there'll be a whole load more because using the algorithms, they know exactly what you're looking at. Exactly. But how come, let's say, do you think that there's more big brands that are on social media because they can afford the promotion? How come do we have this domination of the market of these uh, name brands for such a long time and there's not much movement in the market? There's no um, uh, brands that just pops out of nowhere. Or is there have, have there been any uh, brands that just came out of nowhere and it basically is on par with the rest? Like, yeah, that is like Richard Mill. Essentially, it's only like 10 years, like, in the watch market. And, 10 years, yeah. Yeah, and they're starting to do, like, play with the big boys. Huh. Like, a normal Richard Mill would be, uh, how much, 150? RM35? Yeah. 
and they're reselling for 250 Yeah. And it's just like the demand. They're like shoes, like Yeezys. When the hype was up, yeah. people w- wanted it. So how in the watch industry do you create hype? Hype is um, supply and demand, essentially. Mm-hmm. If you have less supply, demand is going to increase. Yeah. Because people want it. It's basically, if people can't have it, they want it. That's how the world works. Simple economics. Or you could be smart and sell your watches to selected individuals. Like, for example, Cristiano Ronaldo or Drake or your famous tennis player. You know, that's, oh, yeah. what, that's what Richard Mill do. They, they target, you know, well-known people. They will make them sign a deal with them. Whereby, if I give you a watch, please wear it at your next tennis match. People see it on TV, but Instagram, let's just go back to Instagram because that is the main platform. Drake micro. goes out, he posts a picture on Instagram, I'm in the club. RM69. People, people then focus on his wrist. Oh, what's that? Actually, hang on a minute, that's not a Rolex. That's a weird shape. Hmm. Um, okay. The watch um, Jan's talking about is called uh, Richard Mill RM69. Yeah. Known for 69 because it has three dials that spin and gives you a cheeky message. Yeah. Ooh. Um, it's a bit um, uh, not suitable for our target audience. I- I'll let the uh, the listeners uh, Google that for themselves. RM69. 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 Thank you. But for, for me, what uh, I think Richard Mill has changed the game is how they work with materials. Yeah. Like materials and movements. Because these watches are really light. Less than 20 grams... We have a tubby or, like for example, the Nadal watch. Yeah. He wears an RM27, dash one, dash two, and dash three. My favorite is the dash two, RM27. And it's just, you've probably seen it on TV, orange strap, white face. And that watch is just remarkable because you can, like, these tennis players are hitting shots over 100 miles an hour. <gasps> yes. And it's a complicated movement. So it's suspended, like, it's suspended with suspension holding the movement together. Yeah. With, with these metal, well, I'm not sure if they're metal or titanium, but these Probably ropes. titanium. Yeah, just holding the movement together. Yeah. And being able to sustain the shock required, and that's like engineering that was, to a di- different level. That's, isn't like Nadal's one is, is a, a bespoke one built for him, which is like, he can't even feel it on his wrist how light it is. I've heard about... Like, his one is, like, they sell a very similar one. Yeah. And it's known as the Nadal RM27. Yeah. That's his number that's been given by Richard Mill. Right. To him. Um, what material was it made from? Um, do you know? I'm not sure, actually. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's a remarkable watch. I mean, we're all materials engineers here. We learn about G-Force, for example. And yeah. like Shub just said, you know, you're hitting a ball at 100 miles per hour even more. You know, if you were to do that with a Rolex, I'm sure after uh, maybe five years, the, the some of the springs might come out of balance, mm. you know, and you'd need regular servicing. Yeah. You know, you could get a Richard Mill and you could throw it at a concrete wall and maybe the uh, the surround might be a bit scuffed, but in terms of the actual watch, you're still good for still another... Um, the material is called Quartz TBT. Quartz TBT. TPT. TPT, Quartz TBT, people. And that's um, a similar material and now McLaren has started to use it on their steering wheels. Wow. So they've got a partnership with McLaren. So they make the RM35 Senna edition with McLaren now. So essentially you have a bit of McLaren on your wrist. A little bit of McLaren on your wrist. I'm just no, reading. this is the technology then giving to McLaren. The material right, technology. Okay. Oh, thin. Well, that's that's pretty impressive. Well, hopefully that improves the sales of uh, McLarens now. Oh, <laughs> um, I think they need it. Probably the resi- the residual value, especially. That's correct. Uh, yeah, McLaren depreciation and all of that. That's probably that could help them out. Um, so we talk about Nadal. What about Federer? What does he wear? He wears um. He wears a Rolex. He's a Rolex ambassador. Rolex so, ambassador. So he wears any of the diving watches. Submariners, Daytonas. So, would you say when a celebrity's post on Instagram comes into your feed and it's not written paid partnership, can you still see if they tag the watch brand that they're wearing? Because you know, like, in uh, fashion, somebody will pose 
yeah. uh, and post a picture and then they'll tag the designers, the people who worked in uh, creating the outfit. Do celebrities do the same thing for watches? Do they tag the watches of the watches brand? I don't think so. I think from what I've seen, they don't actually do it and that is part of the A missed opportunity? Do you no, think? well, I th- honestly, I don't think they have to. You know, if, for example, Drake puts out a photo and he has a nice... Uh, Richard Mill on his wrist I don't think Richard Mill would appreciate it if they tagged him or if he tagged them into the photo now you might be thinking how does that work but it's almost like a begging scenario you know please po- uh, post a picture of the watch we've just given you or the watch you've just bought yeah. and tag us in there it's almost like a free advertisement which is something that they don't want to be exposed for okay product placement yeah so that's very good all right that that was really interesting i learned some new things and uh if we're going to move on shall we to uh the resale of watches slash investments so this is a full mar- this is an incredible market and it's a wormhole we can dive deep in so um let's start about for example the going back to the independent watches and their residual value their um second-hand market value compared to these named brands, how do they differ, and uh, what's this uh, market uh, of uh, used watches to buy and sell? How does it work? Tell us about um, it. So the independent watch market is a bit different to the normal, like, high-end, is because it differs, it differs from company to company. For example, you have, fan, like, fans for MB&F and FB Jean. These yeah. are, like, the two really big ones. And... You get, for example, FB Jean, like, the market now is starting to get better and better. So, the overall uh, price, so, so it's like, I think, 20, 30% over retail Yeah. now, and it's starting to increase. Jeez. And the level of, like, it's starting to increase is quite significant. So, I think, give it two or three years, it will be really high Wow. for FB Jean, because people are starting to understand the company itself, because I feel like they're artists more than anything else. Huh. Because they're creating art in the movement itself. And they take pride and care for their bracelets, their straps, their case, yeah. everything they do. Because it's everything's done in-house. So does that um, show in the value? Yes. So the quality of everything done is by far better than like companies like Rolex. For, yeah. Because That's Rolex is kind of like, they say it's um, like batch. But it's kind of like mass produced because there's just making so many. Okay. Whereas these companies are making like five hundred to a yeah. thousand mass a year. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rolex is probably making that in like, like a day or less than that. Yeah. Really, I'd say so. Yeah. What they do? Oh, wow. They do. Yeah. Wow, that's big numbers. Wow. So, um, how does this work? So, let's use and again an analogy from uh, the automotive industry. Uh, we're in the UK, when we look for used cars, we're going to go on Auto Trader, Piston Heads, we're going to go on Gumtree, we're going to go on eBay um, for cheap uh, uh, things that cost less than 500 quid. You've got auctions for like bangers or for really prestigious cars, you've got like some luxury ones like Silverstone Auctions, RM Sotheby's, and all this. How does that compare to the used watch market? When I've bought watches in the past, there is one website that I always flock to, and that is a website called Chrono24. Okay. This website is unbelievable. It is your eBay, your auto trader, your piston heads, and your classic driver all in one. All in one, so how does that mean? When you go onto the website, they don't just sell premium watches. They sell 80-pound Seiko 5s. They don't just sell Seiko 5s from the current age. They sell Seiko 5s from the 80s, the 70s. They sell vintage Rolexes. You can buy a limited edition Tiffany Patek Philippe Aquanaut on there for £150,000. And the reason why I like this platform is because they have a safe basket, essentially. Right. You know, the the sellers are pre-approved. You make a payment... That payment is then put into an, an online escrow. escrow account. And once everything is satisfied, the payment is then taken and the watch is delivered safely. Sweet. 
So that's how it works, Trojan 24. Yep. That's how it works for me. Oh, for you. But I think I'll pass this on to Shu. I feel like I love Chrono 24 because you have so much variety. Yeah. Like you can literally go there and find every most things. Most things. But when it comes to classic watches, classic watches is completely different because with classic watches, because they're so old and they have so much like like patina and yeah. heritage and stories. Like I feel like Houdinki has a website, like mm-hmm. Houdinki Shop. Okay. Is one of the best places to buy like classic watches because they do their research. You're obviously paying a little bit more, but you know the thing you're buying is basically being looked after, has good like it's good quality and you can trust what they're saying. Because a lot of the time when you're buying classic watches, there's a lot of things that can go wrong because the serial numbers might not match. The uh, like uh, the dials might have been replaced by a third party. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things that can actually like not be right. Okay. The, the watch hasn't been serviced on a regular. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of automatic watches. I do look at automatic classic watches. I own uh, uh, I own one myself, and when I looked at buying that particular watch, I wanted an example that was re- that had been regularly ser- serviced. Yeah. You know, just like a car, you like to look at all the the pictures. You then flock to the description to see if it's got full service history. Yes. A lot of people look at the mileage, and yes. then a lot of people look at how many previous owners. Yeah. Um, but it's all a gamble. You know, you could have five good previous owners. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's a hard one. But I trust Chrono Twenty Four, and Shub has actually shown me the Hadinki site. And you know, if you're into your classic Omegas, your classic Rolex Submariners, you know, from the wartime with, you know, patina, you know, um, a bit of rust on the, the casing, that is definitely a, a good platform uh, to, to buy from. So this is interesting. Uh, so, like you said, in, in cars, uh, we have, uh, we look at the MOT history, put the, the wrench on, on the website, we look at the MOT history, we can see the fails, what happens and all this. You have us. You can have some history behind it. You can track a bit of the provenance of the vehicle. How does that work in the watch industry? I'm interested in buying um, a watch of a brand that is 30 years old, and I want to make sure that it hasn't been replaced by some knockoff uh, parts that has been well serviced and all the materials are genuine. How can I verify that uh, on an online platform? That's where like. I feel like you can trust Hudinki because mm-hmm. they would actually get in the watch, do their research, and write their basically seal okay. of approval. Yes. But obviously you're paying a little bit premium, a premium I see. for that service. Mm-hmm. Or you could go into like a used in a like watch dealership yeah. and buy it from there. But I feel like today's day and age, you everything's done through the internet. Yes. And not a lot of people actually go into boutiques to buy watches mm. which is a shame because again when you're spending a lot of money on a luxury product uh, for yourself you're paying the same money online or in a store and for that money better get the experience of talking to someone being in store seeing touching feeling um, that's for example if I'm going to buy a new iPhone or if I'm going to buy a pair of trainers I prefer spending the same amount of money in a store and have the experience this buying experience go to Hermes for example to a buying them online, the experience of buying is, is, is something special and that should be uh, more um, brought back into the watch industry as well. So uh, going back to this following of uh, checking the, the history, the provenance and all this, uh, it's like a bit the cars, like collecting cars, bring a trailer, something like that, where they curtail. Yes. Uh, so in the watch industry, there is just like... The, the term that we use in the automotive industry, mm-hmm. matching numbers. Matching numbers. In the watch industry, for certain watches, we have matching numbers, uh, serial numbers. Um, and secondly, uh, we also have box and papers. Uh, so uh, the box is the original box that the watch came in when mm-hmm. it was purchased, and the paper is a certificate, essentially, um, just to prove that the watch is made out of certain materials. It proves where the watch was purchased. It proves when the watch was pro- purchased. It proves who the first owner was. Now, I'm not saying try and find a watch with box and papers. Ideally, that is that is the best thing. Yeah. But 
for some vintage watches, you know, it's it's a false hope. You won't get a vintage watch that, you know, from 50 years ago with the original box and papers. If you are, you're spending an absolute premium. But there are some things that you can look at. For example, if I went onto a website uh, that isn't well known, I just bought a watch. Yeah. No box, no papers. I get the watch. I open the box up that it comes in. The first thing that you can look at is if the watch has been polished. Mm -hmm. If the watch has been polished, maybe it was a genuine polish. Maybe the previous owner did not like the watch being scuffed, so he polished it. Yeah. If the watch is unpolished, and this is another thing as well that a lot of uh, watch uh, aficionados look at, they look at unpolished watches because they prefer watches in their current state. Right. It proves the originality. It's like, for example, buying a classic Ferrari mm -hmm. in its original paint. Yes. Whereas buying a classic Ferrari that has been repainted. It loses a bit of value. So, the second thing that you can look at is when you turn the watch over, a lot of watches have a watch case. Yeah. If the rest of the watch is looking very dull, very sort of like a dull silvery colour, but the watch backing is very shiny, yeah. that can mean either two things. Maybe the watch case, maybe the watch cover has been replaced, so that's one part that's been replaced. Okay. Or maybe there's been a recent servicing whereby the, the whole movement might have been uh, replaced. So you may have a functional watch, but the actual movement inside is not the same age as the actual watch itself. This is not much numbers again. And also one thing to look at is, and this is a bit of a controversial topic, I believe is the glass. Okay. You know, it's very difficult to find any watch, a classic watch, yeah. let's just say, that hasn't been dinged or scuffed of course. at any point in its time. Yeah. If you take a, a watch out of its box and you analyse it under some good light and that watch has pristine glass, you know that that glass has been replaced. That's a good tip, good consumer tip here. Um, I feel like let's go get back to our topic, actual value and resale. Yes. Um, I feel like for that is two companies, Patek Philippe yeah. and Rolex. Okay. They're basically the king of value. So because uh -huh. essentially a watch in today's current world is an asset. And I think buying a Patek or a, any limited edition Rolexes is a genuine asset because it's kind of like sometimes like 50% over retail. Yes. And if you're able to get that watch... At retail. At retail. That is actually a lot of money. For example, a Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711. Yeah. The most, one of the most iconic watches out there. Retails at 26,000, I think. Oof. 26,000. Yeah, 26,000. And then it resells at 60,000. Oh, God. Ooh. Trying to get on the waiting list is around about 8 to 10 years. 8 to 10 years. So you go into the um, store, the boutique, and they'll just tell you, yep, yeah, well... We'll Wait, let you know. And we'll let, we'll, we'll you know. call you. That is crazy. Unless, unless you start buying more watches and work yourself up. So you buy... Like, for the list. Yeah, so you buy Rolexes from there. You buy Tudors from there. Yeah. You buy any other watches. So you get a priority. Over that, I see. Yeah. Because you're basically making the, getting business. So you, you get to build a relationship. Mm. I totally get that. So what does that mean when you mention like Rolex, Patek and all this? Um, how about other big brands like Breitling how about Tissot how about all these <laughs> I'll let John answer this one see most people in the world yeah. would appreciate brands like Breitling and Tissot for example but Cartier as well and Cartier, Cartier. yeah but in terms of if you know about watches, yeah. you tend to sort of sway away from those oh. brands. So why would you sway away from these? I think, you know, when, when you look at, when you look at, when you think about ro uh, watches, you, you know, you, you, you automatically look at, you know, brands like Rolex, you know, your APs, Audemars PAs, you know, you've got Patek Philippe, you've got, you know, if you're really into your watches, you'll know... Uh, about Vacheron, Constantin, you know, um, I think I think what it is is a lot of people um, in the normal world they'll go out they'll see a nice Breitling a big Breitling yeah, on someone's wrist one. and they'll be like do you know what I want one of those yeah and I think it's also as well Breitling have quite a few stores especially in the UK I've seen quite a few you know 
and you can go into a Brighton store and you can buy a watch. Yeah. You know, when you go into a Rolex store, I'm not saying you can't buy a watch, mm-hmm. but you have to be a certain type of customer in order to get something out of it. And let's, and let's just put something out there. When you go in to buy Rolex, yeah. more often enough, you won't be walking out with a Rolex because you'll have to wait. Really? Yeah. Whereas a Breitling, can you, you can get, get one. Thing? Yeah. So how come would one have to wait even if the Rolex is on display? Well, like I said, you walk into a Rolex store and more often enough you will walk out without one. But sometimes you will go in there and you will walk out with a watch because Rolexes, well, Rolex stores do have some Rolexes. And they're, that's inside. their cash cows, like the Oyster Perpetual, yeah. like the Day Day. Or the Air King, for example. Yeah. That's where they're like affordable watches, not affordable. <laughs> no. They're still high end luxury yes. watches. But <laughs> when I mean affordable, is affordable for the mass. So these are the watches they're making to sell a lot of numbers. Yes. Yeah. You won't be able to go in there and buy a GMT Master 2 mm-hmm. Pepsi or a GMT Master 2 um, Batman. I see. Yeah, you could be walking the, the the streets of Geneva. You could be in Dubai Mall. You could be in, uh, you know, the uh, the lounge at, uh, well, not the lounge. You could be at Heathrow Airport, yeah. for example. You could be walking past any sort of Rolex store, and you'll see the same type of Rolexes in the window. Yeah. And those are the watches that they want you to buy. Right. You know, if you're a proper watch person, you yeah. will know you'll know definitely not to buy those watches because you'll automatically sink anywhere between two to eight thousand pound on those watches when you could have used that as a deposit for a watch for example Patek Philippe Mm. so I see there's a there's a gravitas towards these brands yeah Um, how about uh, Tagua um I like the smartwatch yeah so for me Tag yeah. Is really I really love them when they used to make their old stuff. Okay. So just the here. Yeah. N- not tag. Okay. So they made make this watch called the Skipper. Okay. If you know your watches. And that's what like it's really simple. Like the face is really simple and it's got like simple colours. Okay. And that's what used to make me like here as a company. I see. And then now tag here is trying to go into the mass. So they're trying to make cheaper watches with quartz movements. For like one thousand five hundred, even one thousand pounds. So the quality is decreasing, but they're trying to get target the newer um, target market. Yes. Um, but like the watches, like the Tag Monaco, mm-hmm. I still really like. Yeah. It's an iconic design because it's square, and it's just got the iconic Monaco livery. Yes. As well, but I'm not a huge fan like of their new modern watches. Okay. So, it, why is um, you don't have that interest to the new watches compared to the classics? Old, yeah. Mm. I think a brand that we're actually forgetting here is Tudor. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Tudor. So, Tudor is uh, essentially the sister company of uh, Rolex. Okay. Yeah. Or for anyone who does business or economics or works in finance it is a subsidiary company of Rolex they are to what we say in the automotive world Maserati is a poor man's Ferrari okay and you have a Ferrari (laughs) Rolex is your Ferrari Tudor is your Maserati oh that's interesting but I love Tudor I love Tudor as well like I think Tudor might be my first like my actual proper proper Swiss watch. I do have a Swiss watch. Yeah. But I think like if when I spend a lot of money, my first proper expensive Swiss watch is going to be a Tudor. A Tudor. Tudor for sure. I made some notes just before this podcast, and I've got here Tudor Black Bay GMT three thousand pounds. Three thousand pounds. Three thousand pounds. Uh, that seems quite attainable for yeah. somebody's first uh, delve in the watch uh, world. Should we say? Is yeah. that uh, more um, more uh, approachable uh, as a young dynamic yeah. graduate? And also, they're starting to make their in-house movements. Correct. So it's not an ETA movement; it's an in-house movement. So you have like the heritage. Yes. Side, and like old Tudors used to have like Rolex back case, crown, 
It was basically a Submariner, but just with a two-lit badge, because it was yeah. basically made in the same factory. Oh, okay. And they were just trying to make it for more people. That's that couldn't afford a Rolex. So I'm learning something new. Tudor is uh, the... Is it a sister company to Rolex? Yes, it's a Correct. sister company to yeah. Rolex, and it's a good way to get your first... Um, premium quality switch watch and when we look at the time i think it's ready for us to take a break so um hang in there we'll be back in a second okay welcome back everyone we're back from our break and we've got plenty more to talk so, carrying on our conversation about watches, let's start by getting to know you even better now. Guys, uh, Bjorn, what do you own? So, I own a few watches. Mm -hmm. um, let's start off with what I bought first. So, I can't actually remember what my first ever watch was, but my first, say, big boy watch, the watch that I thought looked pretty cool on my wrist and looked a bit baller... Uh, was my Casio Edifice. Okay. Uh, I bought that watch for about £120. Okay. Uh, it's on a steel bracelet. Uh, it's a quartz movement. Um, so it's got... It, yeah, it's a quartz movement. Uh, it's a chronograph, so it's got a nice little start-stop uh, timer on it. Um, beautiful watch. I wore that every day through college in wow. engineering workshops, in pools around the world. I then went on to... Um, an Invicta Pro Diver. This watch is a Rolex Submariner homage. I wear it every day. I feel like an absolute baller. It has got a steel bracelet um, that is part gold-plated as well. Um, when I go everywhere, a lot of people think, oh, is that a Rolex Submariner? It actually gets mistaken for that. And uh, I think that's partly the reason why I, I wear it day in, day out, because it, you know, it reminds me of something that I could have, and uh, you know, it, it comes with a certain prestige. Um, now, when I met Shub, I kind of, my, my love for watches sort of uh, got a bit deeper. I started looking at the older stuff. Um, and I, I just wanted something basic and simple. Um, and I came across an article on Hidinki, which was about Seiko fights. Okay. Uh, so just by Se reading. Seiko is Japanese. Seiko is yes. a Japanese watch company. Right. Uh, after I read that article, I wanted one. Um, it's just a basic watch, very light on the wrist, um, nothing much to it. It tells the time, Does gives, you, gives you the day of the week, gives you um, everything you need. So I went on Chrono 24. Yes. This was my first time I used Chrono 24. Okay. And I bought myself a 1983 Seiko 5 with 17 jewels. It, it mm. is an automatic watch. Um, God knows who owned it previously Okay. Uh, and before that um, but I love that watch I de wear it day in day out now actually recently um, I took the bracelet off it because it's an old watch the, the, the strap was a bit dilapidated it was a bit stretched uh, maybe the previous owner had fat wrists <laughs> uh, but what I did was I decided to get rid of it and I put a suede leather uh, strap on it and actually in that process um, I was in two minds about buying or trying to find the best strap and actually I, I messaged uh, Shub about it and he said go for the suede strap I've got it and now it looks really really nice now recently um, I then looked at Arabic dial watches oh. there is um, a certain Rolex uh, I think it's a, a Rolex uh, Arabian Night, Arabian Night watch. Daytona Daytona, Sweet. and there's also a, a day date, I think, with uh, Arabic numerals in it. And I thought to myself, Rolex are making these watches with Arabic dials. Is there anyone else who actually makes a watch with Arabic dials? And funny enough, Seiko 5 came up again. Seiko, Ooh. in their Seiko 5 series, produced watches for the Middle Eastern and now international market. Uh, market. And this watch was the SNK 063J5. Um, it is a basic Seiko 5 watch. It's not as old looking as my other Seiko 5 watch from 1983, um, but it's a lovely piece and it has Arabic dials. That's really cool. And funny enough, I bought two. Ha, huh. so thick. That's really nice. 
Uh, I, I personally like the uh, Arabic dials. It's a, it's a novel uh, thing to have. Anything else that you own? Is that your collection? No. Uh, so the only thing that I can actually add to the list is a Hawaii Watch GT2, which okay. was a gift from my father. Um, I wasn't actually a fan of uh, smart watches, but the watch is um, is brilliant. I mean, I don't own I don't own uh, an Android phone. I actually uh, own an iPhone. Yes. So people assume that I should have a an, an Apple Watch, yeah. but I don't. I use a Huawei with an iPhone, and it works well. Uh, Gives me my heart rate. Um, yeah. Tells me when's my when my next meetings are, and it just works very well. So that's good stuff. Uh, and that's a good segue to um, our next uh, subject that we will get on uh, in a few, which is uh, smartwatches and how it affects the industry. So, uh, Shub, what's your uh, collection of watches? Tell us about it. Um, mine, I don't have a big watch collection. Um, my first ever watch was, a proper watch was a gift from my parents, and it was a Casio. Mm-hmm. It was a Casio G-Shock. Uh, Ooh, one, G-Shock. One of the square ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I actually just did everything with it. It was literally bulletproof. You could, I did everything, didn't care, and it would just last. Yeah, it's made for it. And I would just literally shower in it. I wouldn't sleep in it. It just, <laughs> it was too clunky for that. Yeah. But it was literally like I just wore it everywhere, and I just got used to wearing a watch from that. Okay, so we started young. Yes, and then my second watch was an, a birthday present, and it was a Citizen Eco Drive. Citizen Eco Drive. So what's this? A C- Citizen Eco Drive is, um, Citizen, basically an automatic movement, but it doesn't have automatic movement. It's okay. powered by the sun, so it's got a. So it's it's solar? Yes, it's solar. So it's self-powered. That's really cool. Um, And that was interesting for me for the first time. That's like... So you just keep it out on the windowsill. Yeah. And it charges. And it just lasts forever. That's a cool boost tech. Like, I keep it under my lamp. And it just charges. Sweet. And so it just keeps running. Never runs out. Good for the outdoors person. Yes. And it looks like a Breitling Navitimer, if you know. It looks... Literally, it's like a homage to that. Oh, so it looks quality as well. Yes. And it was my first watch with a leather strap. And I've actually never owned a watch with a metal strap. Oh. Or a metal bracelet. Okay. It's always been rubber or leather. Okay, so why are not the metal? Um, I'm a metal fan. <laughs> as you can see, my wrists are really hairy. Oh, yes. And, like, that catches and then tugs. Explains a lot, yes, of course. Um, yeah. But I would actually love to own a metal, but it's probably going to be a Rolex or a Tudor. Top tip, if uh, you've got hairy forearms, uh, go for uh, leather. Or, or rubber. Or rubber. Otherwise, um, shave. <laughs> or buy a pocket watch. Or buy or a pocket, pocket, pocket watch. Which is very hipster. Um, is... And then my other watch was... My third watch was a Seiko. Yeah. And I feel like Seikos, I love their second hands. Yeah. Their second hands are just amazing. They're really dope. Yes. They just sweep nicely. And then last year, I bought um, a Hoop Dinky Special, uh, yeah. System 51. That was 3,500 in the world. Oof. Um, so it's it's a very simple watch, but it's really complicated in the sense, like, it's 51 parts. Hmm. That's why it's called the System 51. It's yeah. funky. It's very funky indeed. And then you can see the balance wheel. And it's just, like, something fun. Yes. Like, it looks, like, classic from the front, but when you turn it over, it's, like... That's how, really nice. How would you explain it well? I had to describe this to, to, to the audience. It, it has... Uh, I need some help to describe this. So, Ever watch videos um, online? Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. A it's bit. exquisite. Yes. It's There's sort, a lot of things going on there. It's a sort of... Um, you know these patterns uh, that you can see online or pictures and you think that they're moving? That's... Uh, the vibe I'm getting from it and if this podcast blows up we can afford to have a live streaming set up and have donations and um, YouTube premium or whatnot, and that have uh, cameras to show this it's a proper piece of tech um, a tech a proper piece of kit a mechanical kit that is so is that a kit collection? yeah that is my that's collection. really cool uh, then we're going to move on to um, market so uh, we are very well uh, knowledgeable on the European market the, the Occidental uh, Western uh, market but the Middle Eastern market is slightly different so uh, Jan um, part time Emirati yourself what can you tell us about 
the market from the Middle East? The market in the Middle East is endless. Uh huh. You know, uh, the Middle East, the people of the Middle East, they have a lot of money. They have yes. a lot of cash to burn. Yeah. You know, uh, we previously talked about resale values. Yeah. For them, resale value equals retail value. They don't see it in that respect. Okay. You know, um, a lot of them, they see something, they want it. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the time in the Middle East, if someone has something, they don't necessarily want the same thing. They want the better version. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, if I've got a nice Rolex Submariner on my wrist, uh, they want a Rolex Submariner, but something that's encrusted with diamonds, for example. Yeah. You know, to get something always, custom. It's always the one up. Yeah. Or something rare, like a Rolex Comex. Yeah. Or a double red. Yeah. So that's really cool. And um, what else does the Middle Eastern market offers that our market doesn't have? I feel like they make watches for people because the, I think the Middle Eastern market is more, they like their watches flashy. Yes. They want the next best thing. And so there's so many different variations, whereas the European market is more reserved. Hmm. They like making subtle watches. Yeah. Simple, not too, like, not too flashy. Mm-hmm. Whereas... Like the cars, like the cars are, have red interiors. Yeah, yeah. Like something bright. Yeah. Make that bling. Yes. Make that bling, mm-hmm. son. I'll give you an example. For, um, there is, uh, well, back in the day, I say back in the day, in the, uh, in the early 90s, uh, you could buy a Rolex Datejust mm-hmm. uh, with the UAE crest on the dial. That's cool. That is very, very cool. It's something you don't see, um, you know, even with Rolex again, yeah. um, there is a Rolex dealer, dealer in Oman. Mm-hmm. And if you just so happen to buy Rolex from them, yeah. if you get the Rolex, turn it over and tell me what you see on the back cover. You see the Rolex um, swords, um, which is unbelievable. Wow. The you know, Omani crest. The Omani crest with the, with the swords. That's really cool. And that's only available in Oman. From that one dealer. From that one dealer. So how would one get it? Second. So I think you need to be uh, a citizen. Correct. You have to be a citizen, yeah. And then wait your turn. Wow. So yeah, it's not... You just can't go in and buy one. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's proper privilege there as yes. well. I will, I will... Well, I will say one thing. In, in the Middle East, there is a lot of uh, cabinet cases yes. whereby in the Middle East you'll have places boutiques little plazas you can go into and you'll have offices and um, a nice Middle Eastern bloke uh, across the counter will open his cabinet and he will take out a tray of watches Yeah. Um, and some of these watches you can't even get in the UK with the snap of your fingers you know you'll see things that you have to wait 10 years for but in the Middle East you can get it immediately. you know immediately um Fortunately, there is a drawback with it because okay. a lot of these watches uh, are gifts of gifts of gifts or accidental um, wins in uh, in um, bets, <laughs> you know, in casinos. So yeah. no papers or boxes. No papers. No papers. No boxes. No nothing. Okay. And it you just d- walk away with the watch. You just have a pre- like a exclusive watch. You so go into a nightclub and yeah. some nice Middle Eastern bloke especially if you're a nice uh, looking lady, yeah. might offer to uh, take the, the, the watch off his wrist and he'll give it to said lady. And said lady, all she needs to say is, oh, this is a very nice watch. And said Middle Eastern man will be like, well, you can have it. And then, of course, that lady doesn't keep the watch. She will then sell it on and that watch will end up in a cabinet in some Middle Eastern guy's... Uh, dodgy uh, in, in inverted commas uh, boutique oh, oh that's interesting so do you think that they really do give that to women because you know uh, male watches are for male people so basically it's it just giving them an asset for them to pawn yes um, you know some some girls will know what the watch is if it yeah. is a, a, a Rolex or a, a, an AP yeah um a brand that we haven't touched upon is actually Hublot, but if it's a Hublot, yeah. if it's a Patek Philippe, of course they will take it um, and they'll use it to their advantage. Um, and, you know, for for someone like myself who wants to buy a watch yeah. and wants to buy a watch for use, yeah. for use for many, many years, 
it's perfect. I can go into a, a you know um, an informal boutique in the Middle East and I can buy you know a, a, a Patek Philippe Aquanaut for say uh, twenty the equivalent of say twenty five thousand pounds. Whereas in the UK I'll have to pay thirty five thousand um, pounds and I'll get box and papers. Whereas the one in the Middle East will probably uh, come without box and papers yeah. and might be heavily uh, scuffed. Yeah. Ah. That's interesting. So, you've mentioned Hublot, which uh, brings us to the segment of the panel. You have uh, two cents to contribute to uh, this brand. Um, I feel like Hublot is a really controversial one because back okay. in the day, Hublot was doing great. Correct. Like with the Big Bang, everyone wanted a Big Bang. Uh-huh. And I think it's similar to what AP is now. Okay. AP back in the day wasn't, it was popular, but I feel like back in the day, I'm talking about like 2000s. Everyone was wearing in the high end market. People didn't want Rolexes. People wanted something different, mm-hmm. and that's what Hublot came with their iconic round and their uh, classic Big Bang design, and their open back movement as well. So Correct. that's a good alternative. Well, yeah. it was a good alternative. And then I don't know something changed, and they started making watch more funkier. And after a while, people were like this is too much. Okay, bit like Lexus. Yes. Thing is, for me, when I think of Hublot, I think of Premiership footballers. Okay. Um, okay. You know, nice looking watches. Everyone knows what it is. Yeah. But it's a watch where you want a watch. You want to look good. Yeah. With a watch. Yeah. You buy Hublot, and more often enough, you don't know what you're wearing. Essentially, right. you know. I don't get me wrong. You know, it is, uh, it is a premium watch brand. It yeah. is what it is. You know, you do pay. You know, you you three or four thousand pounds. Yeah. You know, for for your standard Hublot, but I think it's probably a a brand to avoid. A brand to avoid. Yeah. Ooh. You can park your cash in something that, that you can probably appreciate more. That's, that's very probably something that's more better engineered. I feel like we've missed something, and it's about talking about Gerald Genta. Okay. What's the Gerald Genta is the man. Of the watch world, he okay. made one of the best, like most famous pieces that we talk about. So the Nautilus. Correct. He made that in under. He made the design under four minutes mm. on paper. What? Um, <laughs> the iconic AP, the Royal Oak, design, the octagon. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have the Bulgari Octo. Yeah. So yes, and then we have. Gerard Piguet. Gerard Piguet. Um, we have the IWC watch as well. So this man made one of the, like a foundation for the Swiss watches in steel. Back in the day, everyone wanted precious metals, but AP, Rolex, but AP was the first company to come up with like a steel watch that was as expensive as a gold watch. And people were like, what's happening? Why would I pay so much yeah. for a steel watch where I can buy the same gold watch and it's a precious metal. Yeah. But then it was more about just metal, like the precious metals and its value. It was just like, because you can. Mm. It's because I have the money yeah. to buy a watch made of steel <laughs> and still flex. Yes. And I feel like that's how like all the other watch companies followed after. Yeah. Because it was a huge gamble for AP to do that. Mm-hmm. Using the iconic Royal Oak Bracelet. Bracelet and case. Beautiful. And now I think it's the most iconic. <laughs> when you look at AP, it's, their bracelet is something else. It's like a piece of art because it's so seamless. It's oh. definitely going on my bucket list, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> An AP still. Yeah, same. Has to be done. Has to be done. What face though? What colour? Blue? No. I'm thinking grey. Grey dial, you know, uh, 15,400. ST um, automatic or self winding actually yeah uh, for just... me it has to be automatic yeah wow that's really interesting so is this something new that I haven't uh, oh this is new for me the, all this who blow controversy that's interesting let's talk money now people uh, let's talk cash yeesh so uh, Vion you have a hundred quid what are you buying I'm buying a Seiko 5 SNK 063J5 and the fortunate position is, uh, no fortunate position, the fortunate thing is uh, I own the watch, um, <laughs> I own two. Look at that, flexing. 
So, w- tell us about this watch. Well, uh, as I mentioned, it is um, Seiko's only Arabic dial watch. Mm. Um, it's a part of the Seiko 5 series. Uh, as mentioned, I already own a Seiko 5 from 1983. Um, and this is a steel bracelet watch. It is a, an automatic movement. It is 17 joules. Um, it's, got, it's got a beautiful black dial that offsets the uh, the, uh, the Arabic numerals. That's very nice. Very nice to watch. Mm. Uh, very nice watch to uh, wear. And funnily enough, it's got a 38 millimeter diameter um, bezel. So 38. It's, Sorry, not bezel, case. So it's a lot nice to wear on the, the wrist. Yes. It it seems very fitting as well. I've mm-hmm. seen some pictures of it. That's, I don't know, I'm quite drawn to it. Yes, sure, 100 quid. Um, I'll buy the watch off Graham because he's got two. <laughs> I, I think for the money, that is probably one of the best watches. A Seiko 5, yeah. iconic movement. Um, the sweeping hand, yeah. s- six beats per, sec- um, per second. And I think it's a really good watch. And just to add, this particular watch back in the day uh, was used as a dowry watch, hmm. funnily enough, in the Middle East. Um, wow. Because instead of uh, giving away, you know, your standard, uh, say, uh, uh, I don't know, Breitling or Tissot, yeah. like we mentioned, this watch, you know, it's got an Arabic doll. Yeah. You know, when you, when a Middle Eastern person sees this, you know, they, they instantaneously get very uh, excited. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm not saying I'm going to be giving that to my future wife. Yeah. Uh, I'll be keeping uh, those watches uh, to myself or if uh, Shub here to my right wants to buy one. But yeah, dowry watch. Good. Ah, these are good choices for a hundred pound. What about you, Will? What would your hundred pound watch be? Uh, what would I get for a hundred pound? There's a uh, French brand that is called Lip L I P Lip in the correct accent. Um, I think they do very uh, subdued and um, elegant watches. They're very thin. Uh, it's either uh, it's they call it in in French. They call it white gold. Have you heard of white gold? I have word of uh, white gold. You have word of white gold? <laughs> I have word of white gold. I have heard of white gold. Yeah, so they're making that material, quartz, uh, and it's a very elegant design. The uh, strap um, is made um, out of uh, fabric. I think it's hemp, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, rope. Yeah, hemp. I think yeah. it is. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So and, basically uh, like a native strap, essentially. Yeah, yeah that's, that's about it. And uh, it has like the red white and blue colors of france i think it's very elegant um so that's my hundred pounds so now we're going to go tenfold a thousand what we're doing for a thousand pounds again oh a thousand pounds i haven't really uh accommodated for that um thousand pounds yeah mm. i've got i've got one okay right it's probably not going to happen okay but I'm thinking, if I was in an auction, yeah, and the the auction catalogue was rather large, yeah, and they just so happened to be a Rolex date, Rolex date just on there, a one six zero three, yeah, from the eighties, yeah, preferably early nineties, yeah, and if the reserve was say I don't know a thousand or nine hundred, yeah, if I could get one of those, that's what I'd buy for a thousand. Okay, so you have to have a cheeky opportunity, just cheeky opportunity, that. and I just want to reiterate: this watch probably won't come with box of papers, yeah, because these watches typically trade for just over two thousand. Okay, but if I could get one for a thousand, I would definitely we'll buy try one. We're finding it from someone who doesn't know their value, something yeah. like that. Correct. Um, I one of those Heathrow Airport. Auctions. <laughs> when auction. someone just happens to leave a watch in the toilets. Uh oh. Um, yes, I agree with you, and this is something I'd do as well for thousand pounds. Uh, I just uh, sold um, a Rolex Oyster Perpetual from nineteen seventy four, which was in a rough condition. Couldn't, couldn't be bothered to sort of put it back, so sold it for about seventeen hundred, something like that. So she sure, for a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. For a thousand pounds, for me, it has to be probably a. A used Amiga Speedmaster. Speedmaster. So that's the thing. I can see that we, we for thousand pounds we can't get something new. We can't get. It's a it's a tough value, isn't it? So you guys and me too. We are all going for used. 
I, I feel like it's still really going to be hard to find a Speedmaster under a £1,000. Mm-hmm. Probably like 1200 300 Yeah. You'll find like an old, um, not the, my favourite movement, but that would do. Like it's still a Speedmaster. How about Cartier? Would it do £1,000? You can find Cartiers, but I'm not a huge fan of Cartier. Okay. Probably the Santos is my favourite. Yeah. When I when I think of Cartier, I think of dress watch. But if I had to buy a dress watch, I wouldn't buy a Cartier. Same. Okay. Okay. That, that's cool. So we're we're looking. So now we know what you guys are interested in for a thousand pounds. We're looking at the used market, probably a cheeky auction here and there, um, and then from one thousand to ten thousand. Now we're talking big money. We're talking big boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are you having? Ten thousand. So I'm. 22 years old. Mm. I was born in 1997. 97, young lad. I would... Again, I'm going to mention Rolex. Yeah. I want a Rolex that is the same age as I am. The same age? So, for £10,000, Mr. Will, I will buy a Rolex Coke. Reference 1670. Ooh. Okay. Um, Tell us about that. Rolex Coke. So the bezel is part black. Is it Coke like C O K E? Coke, actual yeah. Coke. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, Ooh, I like that a lot. It's a bit of a controversial watch. Okay. Because when that? we think of uh, Rolexes, especially from the GMT Master range, we think of Rolex Batman or Rolex Pepsi. Yeah. But no, I'm talking about a 1997 Rolex Coke, which has a bezel which is part black and part red. Hmm. Oh yeah, I've seen the pictures there. Yeah. I love, I love the, I love the design of the Rolex uh, GM uh, uh, GMT Master Two. Um, I love Coke as a drink. Yeah. I actually, don't, <laughs> I actually don't drink myself, and my go-to drink on, uh, you know, a social night out is a uh, is a uh, a nice glass of Coca Cola. So I, yeah, and you you're know, drinking a can right now. I am drinking a can right now. So I think a watch that is the same age as me that has some sort of affiliation with, you know, uh, Coke. Yeah. Excellent. £10,000, that's what I buy. I'm looking here, and this is crazy because it's a, it's a huge wormhole that you can jump in. I can see the ones you mentioned in between 9 and 10. Um, I also see one which is the Master 2 Coke um, Fast Lady. Have you ever heard of that one? I've not heard of a fat lady. Okay. Uh, it, so, so you should have I a insert? look. It's a Rolex James T. Manst- Master 2 Fat Lady Coke. Um, <laughs> that's a very funny name. It is. And then just to my left, I have a Rolex Daytona, which is £350,000. Um, it looks like um, something... Oh, produced... this, is, this, this is the um, rainbow. Yes. Come straight from a rainbow. I think we'll have to save this uh, <laughs> for later. For later. For later. When our budgets. <laughs> well, that's it. So, Shug, tell us about uh, my one. Yes. So, for my ten thousand pound watch, yes. it has to be a Rolex as well. Yeah. But it's it's similar to Vian's watch, but it, this is probably brand new. If I can get it at retail, it's going to be a Pepsi GMT Master Two on a Jubilee bracelet. On a Jubilee bracelet. Very controversial here. Coke versus Pepsi. Ooh. <laughs> yes, oh yes. And I think you had a Jubilee bracelet on your Rolex as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that. So that that's what you'd go for 10 grand. Correct. Yes. Okay, so we were working up the scale and now we're looking at 100,000. So this is... I've, I've, for 100,000, this is a difficult one for me as well because the ones I really want are more 150 to 200. So it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one to choose. What would you get for, for that? Like, let's give us a leeway of 10 grand north and south, so 90 or 110. I think for 100 grand, yeah. if, again, I could get one, yeah. I'd go for a Patek Philippe Aquanaut with a Tiffany Dial. Tiffany Dial? T- Tiffany. Okay. Tiffany, Tiffany Dial. Co. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. So imagine a Patek Philippe Aquanaut watch. Yeah. It's beautiful as it is. Yeah. And if you look closer, it's actually got Tiffany & Co. on the dial. Oof. It's about the small details. Yeah. 
these watches are very, very hard to come by. Emphasis on very hard. Very, very hard. Um, but if I had the opportunity to buy one for a hundred thousand, yeah, um, I'd definitely park a hundred thousand. I'm looking at them; they are very gorgeous. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yes. Could I say something else? What can you say? Because it's very similar. Uh... So, again, a hundred thousand. Mm. Yeah. If I could get one, the Tiffany and Co. watch yeah. is the ideal watch for 100k but the second best resort would be a Patek Philippe again Aquanaut yeah again <laughs> Patek Philippe Aquanaut dual time mm-hmm. with a green strap okay green strap major key major key major key with a green strap very nice 100 grand uh, and full disclosure we are not sponsored by Patek Philippe <laughs> we would love to yeah <laughs> Um, you would like to sponsor we're actually Asian <laughs> yeah we are Asian so Patek Philippe if uh, you do uh, feel like you uh, you have um, three watches lying around that you need uh, uh, advertising then uh, please do send it to us um, we would like to wear them yes we'll be very grateful 100k what we're doing Shim who me I have like I said like I like Patek Philippe but for hundred k, I know my exact watch, and that's gonna be an MBNF Legacy Machine Two Perpetual Calendar, pink and uh, no purple face. That's a mouthful. Okay, well I'm gonna show you this watch, and it's amazing. Um, so what kind of watch is it? So it's an independent brand MBNF Legacy Machine Two. So you have uh, you can see the balance wheel on top. Yeah. So how they designed it? Mostly a balance wheel on a watch. On mine is yeah. at the back. Yeah. And they designed it upside down. Upside down. So on the face, you have the balance wheel. Stranger things. So let's have a look at what um, artwork uh, are you showing us today for 100k. Looks pretty nice. Uh, let's see, let's see. So uh, what should be is uh, looking that up for us. Uh, that'd be really cool that actually we could have um, some sort of streaming and uh, cameras probably season two if this gets popular for some reason um, and then of course we're going to move on uh, have you got already your I, I said like 100k I think we'll go to the milli but I think that's a big leap so we need so, to think um, about the half milli here you go okay this so is... shows 100k oh get it that's beautiful that looks like artwork a mechanical artwork um yeah, so it's a be- beautiful watch. G- give us should give us the um, full description again so people can Google that. So this is a MBNF mm-hmm. Legacy Machine Two Perpetual Calendar. Okay. Made in I think this was unwilled twenty eighteen. Okay, this is Basel World. This is twenty eighteen. That's very nice. And it's just really complicated to make a perpetual calendar, if you guys know. Yeah. And that just shows the talent of the watchmakers. Ooh. Because there's a lot of maths. Mm. Very nice. Uh, so that's a very good watch for that amount of money and it looks quite elegant as well that's that's up my street okay the half milli mark this is firstly we're talking about the 0.1% of the 0.1% of people that have the disposable income to park half a million pounds into uh, a wristwatch what are we getting yeah a million divided by two yeah. gives you half a million. Thank Correct. You. For Quick half maths. a million, yes. I would buy. And again, I need to reiterate. Yeah. I'm not sponsored by oh. Patek Philippe. Uh oh. <laughs> it's going to be the Patek Philippe yes. Nautilus reference five seven one one. Yeah. With the Omani crest dial. I like that. Now. There isn't much uh, history online about this watch, but I reckon there was only, I'd say, between 20 to 30 pieces. <laughs> um, 20 to 30 pieces. Yeah. Back in 2012, I'm sure one got sold for £300,000. So in today's money, we might be thinking half a million. Oof. 
So where would you start your research into trying to find one? That's the thing. I don't think it would be that easy. It's not something that R.M. Sotheby's or Christie's would put up on their auction house list, you know. These these things are very rare, these watches. Yeah. Um, you need to find people in the nose. You you'd probably need to befriend a lot of Middle Eastern people, preferably from Oman, uh, just to just to find the uh, whereabouts of you one of these pieces. You need to create a yeah. network. Uh, but just putting it out there, if anyone does have a Patek Philippe Nautilus reference 5711 with an Omani dial, yeah. uh, please uh, send us touch. an email. Yes. That'd be absolutely... We'd love more information about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Half a mil. For me... Like, I really love this watch. I've spoken about it. And it's the Richard Mill RM27-02. Yeah. Um, I'll show you what it looks like, William. Yes. So, let's have a look. So, whilst... Uh, um, so, yeah, this is what it looks like. So, this I'm is the... Very interesting. This is the Nadal watch. Okay. The Quartz TPT. Okay, I'm with you now. And... That is, uh, it looks like it was made by some alien watchmakers from another dimension, another planet, to be honest. And this is like less than 20 grams. This, the, oh yeah, so this is like, it, it's so light you can't feel it on your wrist. Yeah, it's beautiful watch. Yeah, so, but the price is, I think, around about 500 to 600,000 right now. Gosh. The current market. Uh, I, it's hard to fathom someone having on their wrist so much value yes a detached house in Leicestershire I don't know whatever it's it's, it's a ridiculous amount of money um, to have it in your wrist and this is for people that are completely berserk completely bonkers about uh, the watch industry and uh, we're not done yet because some people can spend twice as much and go for the zero 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 zero. What's this? A million. What we're we getting for a million? I think for a million, there's only one watch that actually comes to mind, and this is a watch where you pull up to the club and you don't what? care what anyone says because no. the only thing you're going to be doing is watching <laughs> your watch. Watching your watch, of course. Quite literally, and that is the Jacob and Co. Astronomia. Oh, you're talking right up my street. This is sort of my dream. And stuff. to be specific, I'm talking about the baguette astronomy. Oh, okay. Let me have a look at what this looks like. So, um, astronomy, mm. um, and you're saying it's called a baguette tourbillon. It's uh, something quite special, actually. Oh, there's one for 780, so we're right in on budget. Yeah. I'm seeing this, and I've, uh, yeah, uh, I'm at loss for words. I highly recommend people having a look at this watch. This is um, more than three quarters of a million pounds, and uh, it's probably one of the prettiest watches I've ever seen. Um, Jacob & Co. is your premium, premium um, with an extra premium brand. You know, these watches are owned by the likes of uh, Lewis Hamilton. Uh, Drake has a, a Jacob & Co. Really? Um, immense masterpieces. A lot of these Jacob & Co. Uh, watches yeah. are, um, you know, open cases. So yeah. you can see exactly what's going on. Yeah. And by that, I'm not saying you're just staring at a dial with three hands. Yeah. You know, you're looking at you know roulette wheels. You're yes. looking at planets yes. revolving. You're looking at spiders. Um, spiders. Yes. You're looking at dragons. It, that's crazy. Um, the um, Astronomia Casino uh, in that lineup is crazy. You have this big watch on your wrist, and uh, it's actually a working roulette table. Uh, you can see basically the little uh, ball going round. It is spectacular. Um, they're definitely dream watches. And um, around the table, I wish <laughs> that one of us uh, strikes uh, oil and uh, manages to get one so we can uh, all see it in uh, real life. So this was the money talk about uh, what you guys would get um, depending on the budget. So we started with something which is 
broadly available. Oh, we forgot about your million. Excuse me, what did yes. you say? Yeah. Um, for my million, um, it has to be Rochelle Mill again. Okay, so that's you're a big fan of this brand. I I really like Rochelle Mill. Yeah. Um, and it probably has to be. Where the, are they from? They're actually uh, Swiss. They're Swiss, okay. But I think based in France. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, either the RM fifty six back in the day when it used to be a million, but now they're reselling for two million, three yeah. million. Okay. Um, but. If not that, RM62-01, yeah. and that's uh, a collaboration, the second collaboration with Boeing, huh. and it actually has a vibrating alarm, No. and it's all done by a, mechan- a mechanical <gasps> movement, No. so you can set an alarm, and that is a million pounds, and it's super complicated, if you guys want to Google it, it's yes. called the Richard Mill RM62-01. Um, is it Boeing? Yeah. Yes. So if you want a one million to two million pound alarm clock, you know where to, or you know what to get. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm just looking at it and I am baffled. Uh, it's it, it, it's very special indeed. So that concludes um, the money talk and the budget. What you guys uh, like to have, depending on the money, starting from something which is quite acceptable to something that's quite obscene actually. Uh, so. We talk about these these big watches and what we aspire to have. So, guys, what's next? What's next? So, Tudor. Okay. I mentioned them. Yeah. Uh, you know, sister or subsidiary company of Rolex. Uh, I've got £3,000 and I'm going to buy myself a Tudor Black Bay GMT. Okay. What makes you want that watch? So... Actually, going back to what Shub said, um, you know, for, I think he said, for £10,000, he'd buy himself a Rolex uh, GMT Master II Petsy. Now, take that watch, um, put it in a slightly less engineered case, you know, um, slightly sort of cheaper materials, I'd say, Mm -hmm. and a movement which is similar but not on the same level, and you've got yourself a Tudor Black Bay GMT. Boom. Um, you know, you are getting that watch for £3,000 instead of <laughs> £10,000. Um, yeah, sure. That will be my next purchase. That's really cool. But that's a goal. Yeah. There needs to be a goal in between. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, uh, Timex... Uh, which is a brand that we haven't mentioned as yet. They've released a Timex M79 automatic watch for £250. Okay. I tried to buy this watch. It sold out, but I really want it. It is a homage of what Timex are what what Timex are known for, you know, just simplicity. It's an it's also an automatic watch as well. And funny enough, it looks, it resembles um, a, a Rolex Batman because it has very similar colours. It's part black, the dial, and sorry, the bezel is part black, and the bottom part of the bezel is uh, blue. Very simple, almost reminds me of Seiko 5, the simplicity. You just slap it on your wrist, it's very thin, it's automatic, it looks like a Rolex Batman. Uh, it's not a Rolex, just to put that out there. Um, £250. Uh, please, Timex, um, if you have. Uh, any sort of uh, wishes to reissue this watch to the public, uh, please could you send me an email because I will be buying one <laughs> very soon. That's really cool. Uh, I feel like we've never s- not spoken about this company called Lange. Lange. Okay. Uh, Lange and Schum. What about these? And I feel like it's a German, like most majority of the uh, watches are Swiss. Mm-hmm. This is a German manufacturer. Yeah, same deck of the woods. Um, similar to IWC. Yeah. But why I like Lange is it's just like crazy. Like they don't really care what the others are doing. Oh. Like for example quite left field. Yeah, like this is one of my favourite watches from Lange. And it looks like a digital watch. I can't see what Shub's actually showing you right now, but I know I think I know what he's talking about. Yeah, and yeah it's a beautiful watch. Like it's a digital watch in a mechanical way. That's that's very clever. And it has a like look at the movement. And it's so clever how they've done it, and that's why I like Lange. And also, um, on this particular watch, at the bottom you have two hammers. 
two hammers. Yeah, so it's uh, it reminds you of and the time. And a minute repeater. Yeah, minute repeater. It reminds <laughs> you of the time. It's ridiculous. That's super cool. You essentially have two hammers at the bottom which hit these two metal plates. Yeah. And, um, you know, in a certain sequence, yeah. it will tell you what the time is. By the number of uh, yeah. bells. Yeah. That's super cool. So, you know, I think we're going to be talking about smartwatches, but yeah. if you want a smartwatch... That's, that ba- that's the basically the most mechanical smartwatch you can that's get. That's the most mechanical smartwatch you can get. Like a mechanical digital slash smartwatch. Yeah. That's, that's really, really and cool. And how much are we thinking for this watch? Um, so, without the minute repeater, it's right now 50,000, but with the minute repeater, we get around about 100... And Hundred ninety to two hundred fifty thousand, depending on the material. Right. Okay. So the minute it's re- the minute repeater is what it makes it really, really expensive. Okay. And this is one of my dream watches, like without a minute repeater. Yeah. But I feel like it it'll be so so cool to ha- own something like this. Yeah. It it is pretty, it's pretty sick. Um, so um, I think uh, should will be buying this next Christmas. Um, um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Never know. You, yeah, you never know. If you had to buy a watch soon, yeah, what what would you get? It will be a Hamilton Field watch. Um, NATO strap, a titanium case, super simple, very similar to my um, System 51. And I just love it because mm. it's affordable in sense like for that price under £500 and it's a proper, proper Swiss watch. Will, what would you buy? Your lip? Lip? Leap? Yeah, the lip or leap. Uh, that's quite attainable. Uh, but again, well, realistically speaking, unfortunately I'm a smartwatch guy. This is what I wear every day. So I'll probably get the next Apple Watch that will come in September. Which is a nice segue to go through to uh, smartwatches uh, and what they're doing to the industry. So Apple Watch uh, came out, and again, as Apple does, as every time sort of revel- Revolutionized. I wouldn't say it's a revolutionary company anymore since Steve Jobs, but it's a more of an evolutionary company and makes uh, things in a standard that are um, to a totally different level to the rest of the competition. Uh, everybody has smartwatches now. Everybody wears Apple Watches, and they're great kits to have. And some people just, as I do, have a watch because uh, it's a great tool. But some people consider it more as a watch, as in a piece of jewelry. Hence, they've done a gold one that was like 10 grand when the first Apple Watch came out. Mm-hmm. Um, they're doing ceramic uh, versions, they're doing Hermes versions, um, all these very upmarket ones that cost like a couple yeah. thousand pounds. So, what are you guys take on the luxury smartwatch compared to normal watches? I feel like I actually like smartwatches. Like, I personally don't own one. Mm-hmm. But I feel like they're really user friendly yeah. because there's so much you can do. Mm-hmm. Like it just gives you because especially for fitness, like yeah. you have a heartbeat yeah. monitor. Yeah. There's so much you can do. Like it tells you your steps, and for that, for an actual mechanical watch to do, it's possible. Richard Mill does it, yeah. but it's six hundred thousand. <laughs> yes. So it just makes everything accessible. Yes. And I think it's like a watch like a lot of people's first watch is going to be an apple watch that's yeah. going to actually like for them to introduce them to them to the actual watch market yeah and wearing one because not a lot of people actually wa- wear a watch daily mm. because of everyone using a phone yes and wearing an apple watch just like gives gives you a habit and then people what's the next watch they'll then they'll start looking to actual like actual mechanical watches yes and you'd be surprised by uh the how many young people which are born before 98 before yeah. 98 after 98 sorry the millenni- millennials Mille- no, well, we're millennials but we're talking about Gen Z yeah 2000 onwards do not know how to read a watch they do not know what's the big hand and the little hand do oh really yes yeah. it, it's, it's quite baffling um, this is something I saw uh, recently it was a Jimmy Kimmel uh, bit and they went down to the street and they asked people to tell the time with a conventional watch and you'd be surprised how many people don't know so uh, the smart watch doesn't have this mechanical um, sense of satisfaction this satisfaction factory mechanical feel this is why so many people are in love with 
this piece of kit. It doesn't have that. It's a bunch of processors and a battery inside. What do you guys think? Is it still a legitimate watch to have as an aficionado or is it more of a tool? I know a lot of people who actually wear a smartwatch on one wrist and a mechanical watch on the other wrist because they use that as a fitness tool. Oh. If you've actually, I've seen that a lot. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand it, but I get it because they want their fitness yeah. and they want an actual, because they've been wearing, like for example, you see that in the airport. Yeah. You see people wearing their Rolexes that they've been wearing like every single day and they're used to it. And a smartwatch on a different hand. It, it won't make sense to a lot of people, but if you're used to wearing an actual Swiss watch, yes. you get used to the weight. And the weight is everything because it's just part of your body. Of course, and it's very clever. Um, but I just think it looked weird just having like two watches on each arm. Yeah. I think my, my take, I mean, to be honest, uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm an owner of the Huawei Watch GT2. I didn't intentionally buy this watch, it was a, a gift from my uh, father. Um, but you know, I'm not. I wasn't a fan of smartwatches. But I, you know, after having lived with one, having you know, you know, being an owner of one, I kind of appreciate them a lot more. Yes. You know, the compatibility um, of an Apple Watch is uh, second to none. Although a lot of people who own one, will you have one yourself? You've yep. got one, a very nice example on your wrist. The compatibility is uh, something else. You know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to see on your home screen, you can see, see it. on. The watch you can yeah. you know you can control what your phone does you know exactly, yeah. do not disturb silent you know you That's can true. look at messages from your watch it's a great of, tool it's a great tool but would you consider it a watch in in the classic sense I mean the function of a watch is to tell time yeah, and it does that it does tell time it's got an iconic shape yes and I think a lot of brands. Watch brands. Like, company like Moza. Yeah. Like, Moza is just trying to take the piss because what they do is they take that watch, slap it, insane movement, yeah. and a plain dial. So it looks like a turned-off Apple Watch. Ooh. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you what it looks like, and they just love it. That looks good. Mm. <laughs> that seems quite cool. I think with the Apple Watch as well, everyone knows what it looks like. Like I mentioned, it's an iconic watch shape. Yeah. It's got a premium feel. It's also got a premium price. Yeah. When you have an Apple Watch on your wrist, yeah. you you know you've paid a decent amount of money for that. Of you, you feel do. good. Yeah. When other people see an Apple Watch on your wrist, they're like, this guy spent a decent amount of money. So oh, this... No. So this... Oh, it's a Moza. Wow. It, yeah, and it has right. alligator skin. Yes. <sighs> and it's just crazy how... And you have like crazy movements at the back. <laughs> that's crazy and it's just like the ultimate like I don't care yeah it's just because I can um I really enjoyed that uh, that was pretty pretty cool to be honest um finally uh so thanks for uh, your contribution for uh, about the smart watches because this is more uh, something that I wear on a regular basis this is something that I continue wearing because I think it's a great kit however personally I don't consider it as a watch as a gentleman's jewellery I think you, I probably would consider if I'd have to spend a couple thousand pounds, sh would I get the Hermes watch, Apple watch, or would I get something like a Rolex, like um, Hublot, whatever, Hublot, which is controversial, but uh, another brand. This is a quite interesting. And then uh, finally, to conclude uh, this uh, watch talk, Grand Seiko. Uh, I've heard this name. What is this about? Grand Somebody Seiko. Has, uh, like, I feel like Grand Seiko is the underdog, but it's not the underdog. Like, they do everything better than all these Swiss companies, and they're charging, like, minimal for what they do. As usual. Let me get into yeah, the huh? details. I'm taking, I'm taking my glasses off. Oh, now. okay, we're getting serious now. So, let me put a uh, perspective here. So, a normal watch beats to 28,000 okay. beats per hour. Okay. And that is a Rolex, so you get 10. Um, per second. Yes. A Grand Seiko does 10 per second and it's 36,600 to be exact, I think. And I'll show you a video of what a Grand Seiko sweep looks like. And it's just the most magical thing ever because it looks like if it's the digital, like electronic. Yes. But it's actually a mechanical movement with a spring drive. 
That's pretty epic. And uh, I mean, uh, I, to- I totally agree when Shub says it's an underdog. When you look at the watch, you think, oh, Seiko, very nice. Yeah. You know, this is probably uh, 200, 300 pounds. No. This is this is next level. Yeah. What, what, you know, this this is a uh, what cash use we're talking about here. This is this is a a bad big bad boy watch yeah. in disguise. Like we're talking about some serious movement in something that doesn't look very extraordinary. Oh. Um, yeah, I think Shub's got the uh, the video now. Okay, so let's have a look. Look at the sweep. Seamless. Oh gosh! You know how we talked yes. uh, at the start of the podcast about rails. Yes. Um, these are fresh rails. Like I don't even think Patek Philippe gets their no. sweep. I yeah. think the the best way to describe it is a fluid mo- uh, movement. Motion, yes. It's a yeah. fluid motion. Uh, Water coming out of the tap. Exactly. It's it's um, to to have a bit more of a philosophical view on this. It could be um, like. You know the wa- the old water time, um, you know where they used to tell the time with water just right. flowing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to get roasted for not knowing the name of this. <laughs> um, it will come back to me when we finish. I was podcast. going to say uh, hourglass, but that's with sand. Sand. No, it's um, but hopefully they would forgive me. The audience would forgive me for. But you guys should Google it. it. Like Google, um, a Grand Seiko snowflake, and just look at the movement. Yes. It just. It's, it's just amazing to look at. I think that's one of the reasons I would actually get a Seiko is just so I could just stare at the that second hand. Fluidity is, is is beyond belief. Like my watch, like second hand is like nice. Yeah. But that is on a different level. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, one hundred percent agree. And the quality, like people don't talk about that, but the case, if you compare a Submariner and a Seiko, a Grand Seiko, the quality of the case, quality of the dial itself it, yeah. is next level. Like you're probably. Like so I think in the Swiss market, you're pro- probably getting you have to pay like fifty thousand, sixty thousand to get something that Seiko makes of five thousand. Yeah. One thing I will say is Japanese Seiko movements equals you cannot go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you just can't. They're very reliable. You and know, they're hand polished. Every single yeah. thing is hand like done by hand. Very easy to service as well. You know, yeah. when you own a Rolex or something very, very premium, you're you're almost scared to take it to any sort of uh, uh, watch fixer or watch repair or watch servicer. You know, you you think that you'd have to take it to a, a proper Rolex uh, department store, and you know, if that's your thing, then fine. But with a Seiko, you could take it anywhere, and you know that you know that whoever servicing your watch can probably freely take it apart without any sort of issue. You know, they'll be able to order parts for it, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's probably one of the reasons why I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because the, that analogy comes to, to the car industry as well. Um, how uh, the Japanese make um, a better quality, more durable product for less money than the competition. Uh, that'd be crazy if the Swiss started making cars, we could imagine... Uh, what kind of quality they do? They do, for example, um, Pagani level, let's say. Mm. Um, so, looking at the time, we're gonna have to take our last break before coming back, and we're gonna talk uh, about cars. Uh, this is gonna be brief. We're gonna have to talk about like one subject about it, and it's gonna be a taster to um, a future episode. Well, I'll have uh, you guys come back and talk about watches in more in depth, and we're gonna try and tie this around the cars and. Um, have it more of a automotive heavy podcast what rather than a watch heavy podcast so we're going to flip it round next time um, so uh, hang in there and we'll be back in a second welcome back everyone and uh, let's uh, keep on rolling we're rocking around and we're pretty chill now it's getting late uh, but we're still in a chatty mood talking about things. Moving on to cars, people. Um, so all of this, we're very much passionate about this. We're very much in the industry. Uh, we made degrees and careers out of this. Um, so uh, let's talk about this in particular. We've done uh, the majority of this podcast talking about washes. We had uh, hints here and there of cars. Uh, now it's talking straight cars. 
then um, in a future podcast, we will have a very car-based uh, podcast with some hints and influences uh, of the watches, of course. Um, I think it'll be very interesting. Uh, and you can hear me contribute a little bit more because this is something I'm more knowledgeable about. So, this is the question for you guys. Um, someone who's out of university with a good degree uh, and has got a good grad job. So, they've secured themselves a job for two years at least. Uh, they've got a good money. They've probably gone back home uh, and work and live with the parents. Or um, they... Um, got some expendable money, uh, disposable income uh, to either get a lease uh, or high purchase or probably buy a used car depending on the budget. Um, this is someone fresh out of uni, affluent, um, who uh, just starting off their career, aspiring to buy um, a car, new, old, whatever it is. Uh, the trend, right, which is very popular at the moment for cars, is... Um, Hatchbacks and hot hatchbacks. I think uh, this is what the majority of uh, people have when uh, they start having a bit of money is getting themselves something cool. We get the Ford Focus RS, Focus ST, Golf GTIs, you name it. Uh, it's mostly hatchbacks. We don't see many um, uh, young people in saloons, in estates, yeah. uh, in SUVs, uh, in coupes. Uh, we mostly see uh, hatchbacks three or five door and uh, we do see some crossovers um, and I think we're part of a minority that would basically get themselves like a two-seater mid-engine car um, because that's not very responsible either but you know this is cool and I respect that so uh, in your guys opinion uh, what are your aspirations for the next coming 12 months um, in terms of your purchase because you guys will be uh, fresh out of university into a job um, and you'll be looking at getting yourselves a car so then what would you get in probably six months time pretty soon see this is all down to budget you know you could be you could be the sensible person and you know accumulate your money and buy something sensible yeah or you could be the guy living with your parents, you know, you've got hardly any expenses and you could just go full out. 100%, yes. I'll give you the two extremes. So if I want to save a lot of my money and accumulate it, I'll go for something quite old. I'll go for a, I'm saying a, oh, I don't know, a 2000 Volvo S60, 2 litre turbo. Yeah, the you know, the car. The car's got... Uh, around 250 brake horsepower. Uh, it's a Volvo. Um, those cars are, are meant to do 200,000 miles. Oh. You know, uh, 100,000 mile barely Volvo. Running. Barely, barely running. Um, beautiful cars. Beautiful build quality as well. And back in the day, they were considered very, very safe vehicles. Now, the other extreme is if I wanted to spend uh, a bit more than just, say, your £2,000... Um, I'm looking something. I'm looking at something towards sort of twenty thousand. I would go for a, a BMW Alpina D5 by Turbo. Okay, this is very sacrilegious, and we're gonna have to talk about this in more in depth. Why are you getting a diesel? Why am I getting diesel? Well, first thing is uh, a D5, which is the diesel variant of the Alpina F10 series is a lot cheaper than the, the B5. The B5 has the uh, the 4.4-litre V8 yes. um, out of the 550i. Uh, not the M5, the 550i. 50. Now, the D5 is considerably cheaper, uh, considerably a lot, you know, it's a lot cheaper than the, the, the B5. The D5 is out of the 535 diesel. Um, so yeah, what, why would I get the D5? Well, number one, it's cheaper. It's a diesel, um, so you know you you're gonna have sort of in instantaneous talk. Um, you know, I personally, I live in London most of the time. I'm not gonna be going anywhere. I'm gonna be sat in traffic. You know, those gradual pull aways from traffic lights and stuff. Okay. It's always nice to have a bit of a a talk shunt in your back. Um, Twenty thousand pounds for a car like that. 
I'd, I'd definitely go for it. If you said, no, you're not allowed diesels, I then wouldn't go for a B5 because, you know, for, for the money that you, you, you're looking at a B5, I just, I don't think it's worth it. Worth it. I think, you know, if I've got to be serious, you know, near enough, you know, I want my first sort of decent car, £20,000, I'll be Alpina D5 by Turbo. So this is interesting. Um, you, so you're talking about like your, your, um, that car, which is firstly a saloon car. So Correct. we're not doing a hatchback, we're not doing the typical stuff that uh, a young... We're not um, a rude boy racer. Of course. Uh, I'm not, but I'm getting myself a hatchback. Correct. This is something different. Um, it's uh, you are not looking to exp- because I'm guessing if you go for the S60 you're not going to put coils on it you're not going to put tyres no um, so you're not having something that has much of a vehicle dynamic that doesn't have some sporty essence to it you are not going to just leave London for the weekend and go thrash and rose on the Evo Triangle in yeah, Wales yeah. Uh, you're looking at something that's really comfortable why aren't you um interested in in more of sporty dynamics of car driving and you're just interested in having a sort of a big barge cruiser as yeah. uh, your first big purchase i think i think alpinas are they were built for british roads mm. oh really very comfortable yes. you've got a sporty drive yeah but you haven't got a stiffened suspension where you will feel every bump yeah you know that that car is very uh, conservative over every uh, road surface that you you know just so happen to be travelling on. Um, I'm also a man for luxury. Uh, Will you've definitely influenced me in the past with luxury vehicles, luxury saloons. Yes, the car's not a seven series, but it's a nice place to be. Oh yeah, you have full leather interior. Yeah. You've got a decent size sat nav. Yeah. Yes, we're not talking about the new F90, no. but the F10, yeah. which is what this car is based on was uh, and is still a very nice place to be of course and it seems like a good deal did you say 20 grand 20,000 pounds 20 grand that. fit 5 people yeah mm. 380 brake horsepower yeah you know a boot a very big boot of course Alpina um, badges would that be a car that when you park it multi-storey and you lock it are you going to turn around to have a look before you leave of course because yeah. it's not your typical 5 series you know you've got the beautiful front skirts the side skirts you've got the you know even the don't get me wrong I hate uh, aftermarket badging on vehicles but yeah. when you see an Alpina, Alpina badging is special. Yes. that is something else and especially when you're in an Alpina and you look up at the switch controls in the oh. ceiling and it has the Alpina yes the um, serial number serial number and plate that is just something you know, when when someone when someone sees a car like that, they know that you've you've definitely thought about it. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. So thanks for that. Perhaps um, so uh, absolutely into uh, the tractor game. Um, yeah. The okay. Me, sure, tell us about yours. For me, it's going to probably be a hot hatch. A hot hatch. Okay. So here, so like, we, for example, like I've had the privilege of driving a lot of cars. Yes. And driving big cars fast big cars is not fun because you're driving essentially a boat yeah yeah so when you're cornering like in slow speeds it's yeah. not fun yeah but when you're driving a small fast car yeah it's just the rush absolutely it, because you feel like the forces mm-hmm. and you're like whoa this is actually fun in low speeds it is for these big cars to have fun you have to be going really fast really fast when yeah. i mean really fast like breaking the speed absurd speed yeah bra- breaking speed limit fast double like in smaller cars you can actually have fun oh yeah but it's controlled of course so, so it's, it's, it's momentum not, yeah because you're actually like using the forces and going because I live in Warwick yeah and driving on the Foss way like going to the caffeine machine is so fun because I'm not going crazy fast but the roads are just like, nice and nicely sweet yeah and you're just like everyone just has fun on those yes. roads it's just like you're not going crazy crazy fast but it's just like able to enjoy your car of course yeah and I, I just feel like a smaller wheelbase platform is like the perfect for me right now yes because I'm small like um, I'm just a student and I just need a car that's affordable yes. not too expensive and it behaves like a small car of course uh, I, I, that's um, 100% the case and I think this is why hot hatches even though they're not very exciting to look at um, they don't have that sort of prestige and that this is what I like about saloons this is what I like about estates they have 
um, this sort of adult uh, aura. Um, you are a distinguished gentleman uh, driving one. Uh, however, as you can get powerful muscle uh, cars um, that give you that power, that give you that oomph, that give you that handling. But when we're looking just in terms of European or mostly British roads, these tiny little twisties in wet conditions, you cannot be a hot hatch in them. It's yeah. it's impossible to have yourself a big E63S with that 600 horsepower on the twisties can't catch up to a hot hatch. Yeah, so. it's because it's more usable. Of course, it's just yeah. so much more usable. And I feel like for me, like me being a student, if I work for like a year or two, I would look into like buying a BMW 135 or 140. Mm. Like they're starting to depreciate yes. and become more yeah. affordable. Like I think you can pick one up, decent mileage for fifteen to sixteen thousand pounds, and no, that's no. a lot of car. It's a yeah. lot. Even of the car. leasing plans, like say for example, you wanted a new one. Yeah. The leasing plans for a you know a one series. Redock. Absolutely, uh, yeah, ridiculous. No, no, absolutely, because I've been looking at M two competitions. Uh, they are the mid thirties, mm. and they've got like what less than ten thousand miles on them. Um, I think that's that's pretty epic. Yeah. Uh, this is something. So why wouldn't you get, for example, um, on a two year, a three year lease, uh, a pre used, a pre owned, um, let's say an M five. Well, I could, but for me, um, as you guys know, I can be quite indecisive. Yes. If I'm locked into something and then I start to dislike that thing, yes, I'm in big trouble. You're, you're stuck with it. I'm in big trouble. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and also, uh, the way I see it is I will really lease a car if I have to. Yeah. Um, if I'm parking £20,000 into a car yeah. that I know will get used yeah. and something that I can appreciate... Yeah. Then I'm just gonna do that. I'm of not course. gonna. I'm not gonna worry about monthly payments, you know. And you know the half-assed thing where after you know if I get a leasing plan of two years, you know, do I keep the car? Uh, do I get rid of it? I don't want that situation. I just want to park my money in a car, and I know yeah. that car's gonna be with me for quite a while. Um, um, this is where I kind of disagree because sometimes when you're parking so much money, or your assets into one, like financial basket. Yeah. B- basket yeah. Um, I feel like you can invest if you think you can invest your money somewhere else yeah, and you can it. get more return do that because paying like for example 500 400 pounds a month is okay if you're earning decent if you have a decent yeah. monthly income yeah of course where you can invest that money like for example 20,000 30,000 mm. into something else you know will make you more money yeah in like those three years yeah no it's true I think what it is is for me like I said the Alpina I think it just it it will become a modern classic for oh, sure. 100%. You know, maybe maybe the the B five with the four point four liter V eight. Yeah, that'll definitely go down. But I think the D five. Yeah, it's just it's something about that car. You know, oh, like um, I keep saying, it's not like oh I've gone in, I've gone on Auto Trader, yeah. I've got you know twelve thousand pounds in my back pocket, and I'm looking for a five twenty D. Yes. Yeah. Right, an F ten BMW five twenty D, an Alpina. You know, you yeah. don't see many on the road as well. Yeah. So yeah, that would. Uh, I'm still sticking to my choice. Still sticking to your choice, but again, like you change your mind, like the weather. So it could uh, next week we could have a different conversation. Yeah. Uh, yes. Focus our rest. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of my dream cars up up there is a E34 Alpina B10 by Turbo. Um, that's the DBs, the the dogs bollocks uh, for me. I absolutely love it. Um, Again, oh, this is something that is pretty cool as well. So, the general consensus of this type of demographic of what cars they buy, uh, or even just dull cars, it seems. Even people who like cars just end up buying some boring stuff like C4 Cactus and whatnot. Um, how about having something that's really original and stands out? And I'm not saying something expensive, I'm saying, I'm saying daily a young timer. A young timer, for people who don't know what it is, is a car from the mid 80s well the 80s early 90s um i daily for three years an 89 e34 530i uh it's totally feasible um and it is a cool look to have 
Um, would you guys consider uh, driving dailing a, a young timer? Or uh, one of my dream cars, like I'm gonna get into detail in this. Is Go ahead. A, like I love Porsches. Yes. Like any type of Porsches, yes. but especially the 911. Okay. And That's an ultimate daily driver. Yeah, this is the ultimate daily driver. Yes. And if I can afford, like I would have a lot of 911s. Okay. Um, but I love the 964, the 993, the 930. Okay. But so 993 is where, like, that's like the ultimate. Well, it is the pinnacle the air called. Yes. Um, so you'd have a 993. Would you daily that? Would you go to work in it? If it was a low mileage, why not? Really? Okay. Like, if it was like 20,000 miles, uh, mm. 993, That's big Carrera money. 4. Yeah. You'd get a 4. Yeah. Yeah. Like, turbos are just crazy money right now. Of course. And I would just, like, love to drive it. Um, and it's just, like, one car. Because the thing is, it's your car. Yes. And if I buy that car, I don't want to sell it. No. I was like, I want to keep that car of course, for as yeah, long yeah. as possible. Yeah. And I'm also thinking about investment. I just want to drive that and enjoy it. I don't care how much miles I put in it yeah. because it's mine. Would you feel, cap- are you, would you be capable if tomorrow you have a 993 to commute with it every day? This, this is, it's, this what is your a, main car. Uh, I, I don't think so, no. Okay. Like, I, as much as I want to, yeah. I want it to be special. Yeah. And I would probably have some other type of Porsche okay. if, I, if I had the money and I would just keep the mo- a classic one for the special occasions. Okay. Because I, I feel like it's not as user-friendly as the modern cars because it doesn't have sat-nav, yeah. the heating when yeah. it's winter. Well, okay. So you wouldn't daily a 911. Would you be able to daily a 924, a 968, a 928? Nah, 928 with that V8, I don't think it would like, be reasonable I, I, to do. Yeah, I'm just not a fan. Like, I love uh, 911s. Yeah. Like, Boxers, Caymans are good as well. Yeah. But 911 is just like, I, I just respect that car. Okay. It just has that pinnacle. Yes, yes. So you don't have the same appreciation for the front engine Porsches? Not as much, no. So you won't... Okay, so this is something you have probably not considered, like, dailying an older car. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, would you would you daily know the car? I think if money was no option, yeah. Uh, well, we're well, uh, we talking realistically. We're talking like about people. Let's say we're talking about a demographic that's earning, um, you know, like twenty six to thirty k a year. Yeah. What could they afford? Uh, for that money, would you get a young timer? If so, what would that be? Well. Um, I mean, if I had a budget of say fifty thousand, yeah, I think that's realistic. Because if you know, if you're earning that type of salary within three years, you could, you can, you know. No, that's big money. That's big money. What would you get? I would get a Ferrari three hundred eight GTB. You wouldn't daily that. I would. You are a madman. I'm a madman because it probably wouldn't work out, and it probably wouldn't become my daily. It probably end up at the back of the garage, but. I would daily it. I, you know, I think it's not that crazy of an idea because these cars like to be driven regularly. Correct. They break when they sit. Correct. So if you've got the balls yeah. to actually daily drive it, mm-hmm. it could work out. This is what I saw. What that's on my, shop, on my shopping trip. Oh, that's correct. A very yeah. nice. Is uh, that's a 928? 328. Or three three oh eight. Yeah, there's a uh, H. Da, 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 da. Yeah, because there's one for sale in Loughborough, and I think that's the same one. There is actually one for sale in Loughborough. Three oh eight. Yeah, no, I think it's that one. Um, this is a GTS, that... right? GTS. Oh, the three two eight. Off it. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, GTS. Going back to it, the Ferrari three oh eight. What would I have? A GTS or a GTB? Okay. I'm a GTB man. Yeah. I know it's nice. Having the GTS, the roof can come off, but yeah. I quite like the iconic Ferrari design with yeah, the you know the shell going out. I would have a coupe, right? Yeah. Um, three hundred eight or three two three two eight actually. Um, I'm more swaying towards the three hundred eight. It's the older car. Yeah. It's got a better looking front. You know the engine. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, not not as powerful as the the uh, the three two eight. The younger sibling, but. You don't need power. You know, when you're driving Ferrari, yeah. it's a manual, a manual V8. Yeah, that gated shifter beautiful. mid-engine. Absolutely beautiful, you know. And I feel like it looks like the 288 GTO. Exactly, and that's my it, next point. Yeah, because the lights at the back, yeah. whenever I saw see that car, and like 288 GTO, but then I was like, 
Yeah. That car is very rare. Yeah, that that two A eight GTO had that halo effect on all its siblings. Yeah. That's correct. Which yeah. elevates. No, I feel, I feel like because that was like it was because of the three O eight and three two eight that the two A eight GT. It's it's like a five nine nine. Yeah. Like okay. a five nine nine uh, F, not five nine nine F twelve. Okay. The letter. Okay. And then the TDF. Correct. Yes. The um, what car were we talking about? <laughs> F twelve TDF. No, the 288 GTO yes, is yes. basically the um, TDF Yeah. in today's world. Oh, no, I'd say it's more of the 599 GTO. Or that, yes. Yeah. The, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's weird because, see, the, the, the 288 GTO... So you have the 250... The, the 250 GTO? So they were like the ultimate Ferraris. Like yeah. The high performance Of course. Ones. So yeah. Gran Turismo Monogato, those, that's that what it means, and the, you could have it front engine with a 250, with the uh, 599, you can have it mid-engined, F12. like the 288. Mm-hmm. Um, that's correct. Yeah. So that had that halo effect, of course, yeah. with that. But I think, yeah, Ferrari 308 GTB, my ideal colour is silver. Okay. Um, definitely, if I had to daily drive a car, I would I would go for that one. Yeah. Also, another thing as well, um, you know, a lot of people know because of Brexit, the supercar industry has taken a massive dump. Okay. You know, anyone who spared £320,000 for Ferrari uh, 488 Pista is now crying. Really? Um, anyone who bought a Ferrari 458 Speciale recently thinking that they would make a premium on it mm-hmm. or they would have that as their long-term investment, yeah. um, they've now just started crying. Really? Um, the whole supercar industry, even for, like, especially Ferraris, is not, it's not doing well right now. Oh, really? And I think instead of buying all these, trying to buy these limited edition cars and having estimates in your mind that, you know, yeah. eventually in some point in time it will become a future classic, buy the classics Buy the classic. Because especially the 308, I'm talking £50,000, you know. Yeah. If you want a good example, you're looking at north of 65000 But a 308 at £50,000, in 10 years' time, of course it won't be 50000 mm-hmm. It'll be near enough closing on a hundred, yeah. even more. Well, yeah. You know, don't park £300,000 into a Ferrari 458 Speciale thinking that you're doing a right investment no, because yeah. a lot of people did do that and I used to believe that as well but you know in the, in the swing of things when Brexit comes along and you know we you know we we're leaving the European Union and you know there's the the market's not right at the moment and I, I, I think th- getting a classic you know and keeping it in the collection definitely is, is, a, is, is the way yeah. is the way to and go drive it drive it of drive course. it because as you said if you don't drive it the they won't work. No, yeah. they don't work. I well. feel like uh, right now, for when we're talking about Ferraris, I feel like the five nine nine GTO, today's current market yeah. is a bargain. Yeah. Because give it like four or five years, that car might be a million pounds. Yeah. Well, my my holy grail car is a five nine nine GTB, not GTO. A GTB. A GTB manual. Yeah. So one was uh, sold recently uh, at uh, Retromobile in. Uh, in Paris, uh, what was the name of the auction? I forgot. I've uh, now forgotten. Um, I should know because I uh, downloaded the PDF bro- uh, brochure of this vehicle that we're talking about. I think three times uh, because I didn't want to uh, lose it on my hard drive. So I downloaded <laughs> it three times and I placed each of those files in different places. But five nine nine GTB manual fifty made. Worldwide, yes. and they're worth three hundred k something. Like that. That's what they go for. That's what they go for. But there has been some examples in the past that have been sold for north of five hundred thousand, and really? we're talking about right-hand drive examples. There is one actually uh, on the market being sold by Bramley Motor Cars. It's a black car. Yeah. Um, right-hand drive, of course, manual four hundred and ninety-seven thousand pounds. Four hundred and ninety-seven. Happen. Yeah, do you think it's going to actually sell for that much? I think it will. Yeah, I think really. instead of buying a you know a, a very high spec uh, Lamborghini Aventador SVJ Roadster, yeah, for say just less than five hundred thousand, yeah, five nine nine GTB manual. 
It's oh, it is definitely, definitely the, way, the to way, go, way to go, other than getting your, your Ventador yeah. or whatnot. And also, something again, something also very controversial is the 458 four, uh, Speciale uh, Aperta, which sell for north of 500,000. Yeah, yeah, they're worth a fortune. They are worth a fortune, but I still think that the, the 599 GTB manual will is probably the better investment. Considering, yeah. considering Ferrari have just released, not just released, but they, you know, they just re- well, they released uh, a few months ago the four eight eight piece to spider. I know that's a turbocharged vehicle, and the four five eight Speciale Aperta is naturally yeah. aspirated, but it tends to be a, a common trend. You've got the limited editions, yeah. and then they take one step above and take the limited edition, cut the roof off it. Yeah. That's another two hundred thousand pound. Uh, premium and then both the cars just take an absolute hit because if we're taking it back about 10 years yeah you had the iconic 430 scuderia ferrari yeah beautiful car a year later ferrari they want to celebrate their wins in f1 yeah they come out with the 16m yeah those cars didn't hold well didn't you they? can pick up a left-hand drive Scuderia yeah. 16M yeah. for, I think, £230,000. £230,000. And a good right-hand drive example, you'll find something just over 300000 Really? Considering that vehicle was sold at list price for around 280000 You know, money. we're seeing a cycle here. Mm. The cars are going up by premium and they're coming back down again. Yeah, it's that speculative bubble. Yeah. So mm. I think instead of thinking that a car will become a modern classic, yeah. invest in the classics. Invest in the classics, I think that's a good top tip. I feel like my knowledge on Ferraris is not as high as yours, but I, my knowledge is in Porsches. Yeah. yeah. And I feel Porsche like, versus Ferrari. That's yeah, important. Porsche. And I feel like the Porsche fan base is starting to grow. <gasps> Dude, it's such a culture. It's a cult. Like, the thing is, Porsches are made for people who actually want to drive. Drive, yeah. Correct, yeah. And it's just like they perfected that uh, flat six like mm. perfectly. Like the PDK gearbox and the new Porsches, the nine nine twos, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And we're seeing this is like the the new nine nine two Carrera four S. Yeah. Uh-huh. And they're doing naught to sixty in three seconds. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And that's like the entry level Porsche. Yeah. And imagine what the turbo is gonna do. The turbo S oh, the is turbo gonna do. Yeah. The turbo S is gonna literally destroy everything. Yeah. yeah. Because the advanced tra- um, launch control system, yeah, and the way they manage power, of course, mm-hmm. they're just way advanced. Thing is, I've talked about Ferrari. I think we can all appreciate the uh, Porsche as a brand. So, I've got a question for everyone. If you had one Porsche to buy, what would it be? Ah, um, that's a tough one. Modern or, or anything? Air cooled or what's what's called? What you anything mean? you want. Mm. Money's no option. Option. I don't know. I know. I've got two in my mind at the moment. I, I have three. Yeah. Okay. Like, Actually, it, it, you just know so what? Let to... me expand it because I think Will, he's he's going from uh, segment to segment. You know, air cool, water cool, yes. old, new. If you had two, two or three, I'm gonna be. Yeah. Let's make it easy. Two or three Porsches. What would you have? Uh oh. Uh, this I'm I'm kind of um uh ashamed to to say this, but you have to say it. I'll get a singer now. Yeah. Yes, my man. Okay. Um, I think it's the ultimate answer, and well, it's the ultimate answer. It's it's the Joker card, Singer Nine Eleven. But unfortunately, you know, you, you can't fault the people at Singer. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the craftsmanship, and it just embodies what's the Nine Eleven, isn't it? Embodies driving really. Yeah. yeah. Like same for me as well. Like I love the Singer. Mm. Like it's just taking a Nine Eleven and just trying to make it better yeah. as possible, and. It's just perfect. And I also love the 993. I feel like 993 has one of the best looking rears of any it, cars. It's a very good looking car. It's a last uh, air cooled Porsche. Last air cooled Porsche. And for me, the third one would be a modern 911, 992, probably the new Turbo S. Yeah. If that comes out. I'm not yeah. a huge fan of the GT3s. Um, but the new Turbo S, the 992, when it comes out, yeah. that would be. So I think. Um, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but I wouldn't go for high-end Porsches. I um, would. 
Do you mind if I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Okay, so if I had the choice of three Porsches... Yeah. I hate to be uh, standard here. Okay. In the, you know, and when I mean standard, it's not everyday standard. It's standard in the automotive world. Okay, but basic. Option one... Uh-huh. Carrera GT. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. You 100% know, I agree on that. V10 manual. Yes. You know... Oh. Can't go wrong. Um, oh, I'm yeah. quite, I quite annoyed that I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, so, I actually thought about it, but I'm not a huge fan of the CGT yeah. myself. Oh. It sounds amazing, yeah. but I'm not a huge fan of the looks, and it's just, I'm more of an 911. Yeah, of course. Got it. I think uh, my second choice would be a 996 yeah. GT3. A 996 GT3. Yes, I remember we were talking about that one. Yeah, uh, 996 GT3. I'd go one up on you and go a GT3 £50,000 manual. Yes. You nice know what? cars. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll beat you on that yeah. one. I'll get a 996 GT2. Yeah. And um, my third choice... The Widowmaker. You're the Widowmaker. My third choice... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to break the whole... Uh, theme of old here but yeah. um, I think my last and final choice would be a new uh, 991 yeah 911 uh-huh. uh, GT3 RS okay but a 991.2 yep a 991 so that's the one with the yes, tail lights that go in like slightly inwards yeah. in, indented but that's Again, see, you are talking about ultimate driving machines. Ooh, no, that's been from you. Uh, <laughs> but you are talking about uh, one of the best driver's cars here. Mm. And I really think and I highly suggest that we go and uh, do some track days and you try a Porsche. Yeah. Because uh, you'll probably change your mind from the Alpine and say, oh, crap, I might need a Porsche in my life. If I can get a decent Porsche for 20000 Yeah. Mm. I think there's like some... Like 996 a 996 no 20k will get you 996 a good one um you no but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't settle for a, a 996 uh, Carrera 4 for example I'd want a 4S and yeah. now yeah. considering the market at the moment and, yeah. and I like to talk about markets because this is something I look at day this in day out area. this is yeah my forte uh, 996 yeah Carrera 4S yeah those cars have gone up Big time, yep. yeah, I big that. time. A lot of uh, automotive well. YouTubers as well. Yeah, have started investing in them. Uh, the likes of TGE, and um, there's another person on Instagram. I've forgotten. He's very well known. He's just recently bought one. He's bought a a Carrera Four, and those cars. You know, about ten years ago, you could pick one up for maybe eighteen thousand pounds. Yeah. Now, some examples are touching thirty thousand. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know. Again, I, invest in your classics. Yeah. I, f- I feel like the eyes, the front lights look like ah. eyes, and it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I might have said there's something stupid. No, it's not a classic, the 996. Yeah. It's not. The 993 is. Um, but it will become a classic. So yeah. become it's a classic. controversial. Yes. It was, it, Porsche, it was very controversial. It's Porsche's uh, way of trying to get back into the market. Yeah. So they finished the traditional 911 as the air cool with round lights, and then they started having that um, fried egg uh, front lights, yeah, a water cooled, completely. And people hated it. Yeah, and, and they always say buy things that people hate because in a few years time they'll love yeah. it. Like the Rolex Paul Newman, everyone hated it. Yeah, and now to buy a Paul Newman, yeah. it's like hundred and fifty thousand yeah. pounds. Just to quickly add as well on the subject of watches, uh, I do like my Patek Philippe's. If when you walked into the Patek Philippe uh, dealer yeah. and you just so happened to uh, get an, a nice telephone from your dealer um, for a Patek Philippe with a leather strap, yeah. you're making, you're making a, a hefty premium on those now because a lot of people, when they buy Patek Philippe watches, they go for the typical steel bracelets. Yeah. But those people who didn't want to follow the norm and went for rose gold models or models with a leather bracelet, um, they're making an absolute premium. So <laughs> this is a tip for every, anyone. Buy things that people don't like. You know when you go on... When you go to an outlet store and they sell trainers in wacky colours because yeah. no one wants to buy them, yeah. buy those shoes. 
By mm. by the undesirable. By the undesirable. So so we've got two two uh, top tips from Bjorn here. Um, invest in new classics and buy the undesirable. You will make your money. So on that note, uh, thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Sure. Uh, we're going to end this uh, on perfectly on time, and I. Th- Hope that you've enjoyed our very first podcast and see you to the next episode. Bye everyone.